Aaron, start your video. Yeah, I'm making the little thing pop up. Wait, we're getting so good at this, aren't we? <laughs> All right, Skylar, I'm going to put you in the waiting room, too. Uh, we'll call you back in a second. Don't jinx us, Christy. <laughs> well, I'm a huge advocate of continuing to do this forever, so. <laughs> if I could Zoom all the time, I'd never, ever retire. There's Jefferson. Here we go. Okay. You want to bring everybody back in, um, Alex? Yeah. Let me just. And the public. Yeah, everybody, all at once. Yeah. We are ready. Did you have a nice birthday, Councilmember Wagner? Yes, I did. I actually got a half a day off. Thank you. Oh, oh, I didn't good. know it was your birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, when you get as old as I am, uh, they all seem the same. But thank you. I always remember it's the day before um, 4th of July, right? The 3rd? Yes. Yeah. After Jefferson. I bet, I, yeah. Well, your memory hasn't faded you, but your gray hair no. will catch up. <laughs> Hair color is an option, I'm told. Okay. Um, when do we want to start? Are we all in? Yep. Yeah. We're ready when you are. Okay. All right. There's my gavel. I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of July 13th, 2020. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate everyone's patience so as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org slash virtual meeting. May I have a roll call, please?
I mean, obviously Mikey, and then I have Jefferson in the waiting room, but I have not seen any of the other three. Well, maybe we should just try this again next week or something then. <laughs> Do you want to bring everybody in, Alex? Yeah. Give me one second. I'm sending the, no the ones who aren't here little invite things. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Are we ready? Um, I still don't see, do you see Skylar? Did I, I do. just miss him? He's there. Oh, I already got him in. Yes. Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> okay. Uh, just one second. All right. I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of July 13th, 2020. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations, and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to sign up to speak on particular items or the tab to watch the meeting. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you sign up to speak before an item is called and are present in the Zoom meeting. So please make sure you visit malibucity.org slash virtual meeting early to sign up and speak and download the Zoom application. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and for the public. May I have a roll call, please? Council member Mullen? Here. Council member Peek? You're muted, Skylar. I see that Councilmember Peak is here. Councilmember Wagner. I see that Councilmember Wagner is here. I'm Mayor here. Pro Tem Pearson. Yes. Mayor Fair. Yes. You have a quorum. Thank you. May we have a closed session report, please, Christy? Thank you, um, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Good evening. Tonight's regular meeting convened at 5.30, and thereafter the council recessed to a closed session pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1, no, D2, um, to discuss the threatened litigation against the city involving the California Voting Rights Act. Um, while the city did not take any reportable action, I do wanna provide some information publicly because I know that there are residents um, interested in this situation. The California Voting Rights Act was enacted in 2002, and it's intended to address discriminatory voting practices that disadvantage protected classes of people. The law places a great emphasis on district 
based representation like you see in Los Angeles over at large elections, which is like what we have here in Malibu, where a protected class would comprise a majority of voters in one district, but would be a minority of voters citywide, district elections um, undo the vote dilution and they can help remove some of the practices that may result in discriminatory voting practices. But district-based elections do not make any sense in some situations. Many cities have demographics for which switching to district elections um, isn't going to make any difference um, from the at-large system, and it wouldn't benefit any um, um, protected class. And thus, um, the demand that they change the way that the residents are represented in the government comes without any discernible benefit to anybody. And until recently, um, the legal arguments of these types of cities went ignored. Uh, trial courts were not requiring that plaintiffs prove that district-based elections would actually do any good. And in recent years, we've talked about this, dozens of California cities and other local governments with at-large election systems have been hit with the demand letters under the California Voting Rights Act. And the act gives plaintiffs lawyers up to $30,000 just for making the demand. And then these lawyers um, have been awarded hundreds of thousands of dollars, and in some cases, millions of dollars when they've gone to trial under the standards that favor these district-based elections. Many of these cities and special districts have been switching to district-based elections primarily to avoid the litigation costs. The Santa Monica case that um, was decided by the California Court of Appeal last week definitely changed the legal landscape, and it certainly invites a reassessment of the legal risks that are posed by the threat of litigation against this city. Um, note that this case is very may well may end up in the California Supreme Court, so the opinion may not be the last word, but we'll know about that in a few months. After the city received the threat of litigation challenging the city's at-large voting system, the city, as you know, embarked um, on a good faith and serious effort to evaluate the claim. The city hired um, a demographer and uh, we've held public hearings to consider proposed district maps. And I know that the council has expressed its appreciation to all of those who've participated in those hearings. The COVID-19 pandemic disrupted a lot of things, including the community conversation that we were trying to have over the maps and about district-based elections. Um, also, as it would happen, maps have to be based on census data, and the new census is coming out um, soon, so that any maps that we prepare now are going to be necessarily preliminary. And I guess this would be a good moment to remind everybody who might be listening to this to fill out the census. They're important. But all of this is basically to say that um, given that the law is in flux, and that the process for develop, developing the maps was disrupted by the pandemic and would be you know, better off after the census data is available. The city is not going to move forward with a ballot measure for the November 2020 election. Um, we can revisit all of this when the law settles a little bit and after the census information comes out and hopefully we won't be uh, dragged into court in the meantime. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you, Christy. All right, uh, may I please have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Peak? Yes. Councilmember Wagner. Councilmember Wagner. I see a thumbs up from Councilmember Wagner. Mayor Fair. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Um, may I please have a report on the posting of the agenda? 
The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on July 2nd, 2020. Thank you. Okay, we are moving to item 1A, council reorganization. Um, now we're on 1A1. Can I nominate Mikey Pearson to be mayor? On um, this presentation to the outgoing mayor, Mikey, did you have anything you wanted to say? Yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Navigating Zoom. Um, Karen, first of all, just thank you. And I want to start with, we were elected at a difficult time, and I appreciate everything that you have done during this time to help the city of Malibu through many significant and difficult issues. Uh, Karen very quickly stepped into many roles in representing the city, including, this is quite a list, the Public Safety Subcommittee, the Library Subcommittee, California Contract Cities, Council of Governments, and as our COG rep to the League Woolsey Task Force. Oh, also the SMC JPA, and was recently appointed as the LA County Library, as a LA County Library Commissioner. Quite a list. Karen and I have attended many conferences, both in person and online together. We've flown to Sacramento to advocate and I also want to say how much I appreciate her diving in with me on difficult issues, including homelessness and trying to figure out affordable housing in Malibu. Before our campaigns, I did not know Karen, but I can now say I feel that I have a partner on trying to figure out many of the difficult issues Malibu faces. We don't always agree 100%, but we do work very well together. So thank you, Karen, and now, I am glad to uh, present you this token of appreciation from the city council for all you have done for Malibu as our mayor. Here you go. And I'm looking for an assist. Look to the left or right. Tell me if your husband's anywhere nearby. Just look left or right, Karen. <laughs> He's not there. <laughs> Cameron, please call him. You're muted, Karen, by the way. All right. He told me he wanted to uh, chime in on Zoom. Um, <laughs> Cameron, he's supposed to be there physically somewhere. Probably Is he in the house. Is he in the house at all? I, I'm not sure. I'm in the guest house. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is so wrong. He's there in all the council meetings, and the one he's supposed to be at is not there. So that well, was our well-executed delivery of a very nice plaque to the outgoing mayor. Yes. Another COVID casualty. Which actually he has. I managed to have delivered to him to surprise you. Good job, Cameron. Um, and well, you know what, Karen, thank you very much. I don't know what else to say. The thank plaque you. is on the property somewhere, and we appreciate you very much. Thank you. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me say a few words too, Karen. Thank you very much for uh, working so hard since you got here. It's been a pleasure to work with you. I didn't know you that well before you came on the council, and you've done an outstanding job. And I think you've been very um, impressive and poised as our mayor. And I already told you my favorite thing you did, which is epic and one of the best things I've ever seen since I've been here, even before council. So that was good. But I've enjoyed working with you in the uh, school subcommittee and. Um, your depth of experience complements my incredible thin experience on the school issue. And thank you for tutoring me in all the things that have gone on many, many years before I ever got involved in this. But in general, I just want to say you've done a really good job and you've had outstanding bearing as a mayor. And I think we shall be proud to have you. Rep we have been proud to have you representing us outside the city. And sounds like Cameron's ready to execute the, uh, aforementioned presentation and here you go thank you okay would you like to share that with us all so we can all I see will. it thank you very much thank you everybody i will display this proudly and uh and onward we go thank you and thank you rick i appreciate that well done you served with honor Thank you.
I'm going to put this right in front of me for the rest of the meeting. It's got everyone's name on it. Thank you. Are there any other presentations to the outgoing mayor? If not, we'll move on to remarks from the outgoing mayor. Okay, uh, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I just want to say it's been my extreme honor to serve as mayor since uh, this past September. Um, it has not been boring. I will say that. Uh, just when I felt like things were kind of um, normalizing uh, with the fire and with rebuilding, uh, with our flash flood thrown in, um, we have come into uh, this global pandemic and some interesting times with our budget uh, and plenty of other challenges. But uh, I really do appreciate the teamwork that I've seen. And I just want to say, starting with the teamwork of our constituents, uh, this town has been brought together in a way that, in a couple of ways that nobody would have expected between the fire and certainly now with COVID. Um, and, and I see a lot of people trying to row the boat in the same direction, and that's very encouraging. Um, I do want to thank our city management and city staff. They have shown just resiliency and professionalism and depth of experience and, and huge amounts of respect from their peers. Uh, in corresponding positions in other cities uh, and other agencies. And that makes a lot of things possible for us. And I, I really appreciate that coming in and getting those kinds of introductions and, and history lessons and everything that goes along with that. Uh, I also want to thank all of our commissions. Uh, we have hardworking commissioners who dig deep into the issues and, um, and I really want to thank all of my commissioners. I, I appreciate the time you put in. I appreciate your respective expertise and, and just the efforts that you make. And, and particularly, I want to thank Jeff Jennings, my planning commissioner, who's got more experience in this city than anybody I know. Uh, and even in light of losing his home in the Woolsey Fire, agreed to stay on the planning commission. That really means a lot to me and to the whole city. So that's just huge. Um, Mikey, we got elected together. We have been uh, on this journey together. We've had some laughs. We've definitely had some, I will say, huge challenges that I would have found more frightening uh, had I not had somebody to bounce things off, and most of the time that's been you, and I really, really appreciate that. Jefferson will continue our work on the library subcommittee, and uh, Rick, school district separation, we're just going to keep moving on, and uh, Christy, thank you for getting us to this point with our closed session item. And Reva, thank you for everything you've done. Um, a lot of things you don't get credit for uh, that you've done. And uh, I think we could do a better job of spelling out things that you've made possible, things that you've thought of uh, that have come to fruition or that are in the works. And I give you credit. You take a lot of heat for things that are not your fault, things that are no one's fault. Uh, and and quite often a hostile work environment that nobody should have to work in. And I want you to know that has not gone unnoticed. Um, so, uh, you know, we will continue to advocate for our city, for our quality of life. Um, and I wanna close by saying the number one issue is always public safety. Whether it's uh, disaster preparedness or, or dealing with the pandemic and, and, you know, just today we all took another huge hit with things closing down again. And that's all based on our numbers. So unfortunately, uh, I think we're all going to have to try to do a better job with that. So um, thank you all very much. And I look forward to continuing the work that we do. So now... The next thing is item 1A3, and 
I will start by taking nominations from the floor. The floor is now open for nominations for mayor. <laughs> Rick? I'd like to nominate Mikey Pearson to be the next mayor of our beautiful city of Malibu. I'll second that, if you hear me. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Peek? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Sure, yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. All right, congratulations, Mayor Pearson. Thank you, thank you. And I now turn the meeting over to you. Okay. Um, floor is open now for nominations for Mayor Pro Tem. Can I have any nominations? Any nominations? I would like to, oh, there we go, um, Jefferson. Uh, who, do, who are we usually doing the Mayor Pro Tem to? Well, um, that would be Skyler would be next in order. Okay. Or well, Rick? I'll second that. Okay. Um, hang on. Let me read my notes. You want a roll call vote? Uh, yes. Can I have a roll call vote, please? That's a great idea. Absolutely. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Ferrer? Yes. Councilmember Peek? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, are we at 1A5? We are. Okay. I'm going to ask uh, my wife to join us and she's going to administer the oath. Hi. Hi, Hi. Mel. <laughs> Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Mikey Pearson, do solemnly swear or affirm, do solemnly swear or affirm, that I will diligently serve, that I will diligently serve, as mayor of the city of Malibu, as mayor of the city of Malibu, and that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental re reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you, honey. Okay. Thank, thank you. And now, do you mind if I issue the oath to Skylar? Uh, please. Would you please issue the oath to Skylar? I would love to do that. Skylar, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Skylar Peak. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Do you solemnly swear or affirm? That I will diligently serve. That I will diligently serve. As Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Malibu as Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Malibu. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations. 
Thank you, Heather. Congratulations, Mikey. And Karen, I just wanted to say thank you. I, a lot of people said a lot of the scenes, so I just kind of second it all. Of them. <laughs> and thank you, Skylar, for uh, assuming this role. Um, I'm sure that'll have us talking more because, you know, I don't know, going to need you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to just uh, make a few remarks. I promised uh, Reva wouldn't go on too long, and I don't want to. I just want to say uh, that while I'm impressed with all the items we've been able to get done as a council and a city while we've been in this unending emergency mode, we have a great deal to do. We need to get our city and residents through this pandemic healthy and safely. We need to support our kids, parents, and teachers in what looks to be a very challenging school year. We need to rally around our small businesses, which are facing truly overwhelming challenges right now. We need to deal with the constant threat of wildfires, rising sea levels, and daunting challenges in keeping the city financially healthy as well. I believe the homeless issue will only get worse until we make some important and hard decisions as a community. And we have short-term rentals coming forward and ADUs to figure out. And we need to get back on track to doing a lot more environmentally and getting our council approved projects on, ongoing and our environmental commission up and running just as soon as we can. And all the while, the PCH and the overwhelming crowds that come to Malibu are still the number one issue I hear from residents on a regular basis. And now we need to do all of this with less staff and financial resources than we anticipated. And make no mistake, Reva and the staff are working hard through these very difficult times. And I just wanna say how much I appreciate how hard they're working. I know it's hard for most people to see it's a very difficult environment to get a lot done. So I really applaud the staff and Reva for everything they've done. This has not been easy. Those are my remarks for now. And uh, let's move on to the agenda. Next up, we have 2A, uh, communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction. The council may not act on these matters, except to refer matters to staff or schedule the matters for a future agenda. Do we have uh, any speakers signed up for public comments? We have 10 speakers. I'll read them in order and then we'll go back to the top. Joe Drummond, Colin Drummond, Lynn Norton, Vicki D, Scott Dietrich, Norman Haney, Craig Hill, Anne Donin, Stephen O'Neill, and Barbara O'Neill Ferris. So first we'll hear from Joe Drummond. Hi, Honorable City Council and Mayor Pearson. As of today for MMC Chapter 17.45 View Preservation, to obtain a view preservation permit from the Planning Commission still costs a whopping $2,265 according to the city website as of July 1st. I please ask city council to ask city planning to bring back a more reasonable fee appropriate for this appeal process, such as in the city council appeal fee of $750. All paperwork needed to review is simply mail receipts showing attempts at communication with the non-compliant foliage owner and before and after photos. It's a simple review process. The view owner must also bear the brunt of the initial restoration of views, which is another financial hardship on top of the already prohibitive fee. Please again make a motion tonight to ask city planning to bring back a more reasonable fee to make this less of a hardship of view owners. On another point, I had a slides. So I don't know if they're there. Oh yeah. It seems there is a consistent problem in the planning department and their interpretation of codes regarding gross floor area. It is to be addressed in item 4A tonight and will, was discussed in a case we had with the planning commission over three hearings that will come before city council in September. The definition of gross floor area should be consistent across the Malibu Municipal Code zoning, the Los Angeles County Code, Planning and Zoning, and the Malibu Building Code. In zoning, MMC, LCP, and LA County Codes, gross floor area excludes the garage, so why are we not keeping this consistent with the adopted Malibu Building Codes? Otherwise, what is the point of these codes under the umbrella of Malibu Building Code? And as in item 4A, TDSF should never be used to calculate gross floor area. 
the definition of ghostful area per MMC built zoning code should be used for the Malibu building code. So city council should tonight clarify that this code definition for gross floor areas, both for residential and commercial, despite the planning interpret interprets incorrectly. It states this in item 4A, application of gross floor area for evaluating residential projects would be inappropriate without direction from city council and proper noticing to amend the LCP and MMC to revise the method by which the size of residential projects is calculated. So city council must clarify an absolute definition of gross floor area. When we incorporated and became a city, we adopted a municipal code that included a zoning code, chapter 17 of the city's MMC. This should be applied for both residential as well as commercial as for the existing applicability purpose codes and apply to the building code. Next slide. The planning department argues in item 4A that MMC code refers to commercial because of the use of the words loading spaces in the codes. However, the LA County code zoning 22.04.050, which combines both residential and commercial, also mentions loading spaces. So the MMC Title 17 should be used for both commercial and residential projects, not just commercial. In LA County 2204.05 rules for measurement, gross floor areas shall exclude parking structures, garages, carports, other areas designated for parking and loading, or vehicular access to parking and loading spaces. So your time is up. Okay, Colin will continue. I, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, in Mal Malibu Municipal Code and LCP Chapter 2, 17.0.060 definitions, gross floor area means the sum of the gross horizontal area of the several floors of a building measured from the interior face and exterior walls or from the center line of walls separating two buildings, but not including interior parking spaces, loading spaces for motor vehicles. So if LA County definition is for both residential and commercial, so should the MMC and LCP. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Yeah. yeah. The LCP states in chapter 1G, to ensure that any development in the coastal zone preserves and enhances coastal resources and protects coastal views and access, and guides growth development and environmental management in a matter consistent with the provision of the land use plan of the local coastal program. So it encompasses both residential and commercial builds. Then right after this under chapter two definitions clearly states the definition for gross, uh, gross gr uh, floor area gross, which is the same as I just read for the MMC, measures from the interior face of the exterior walls and excludes garages and loading spaces. Nor, nowhere does it state that it's solely for commercial development. Both city and county zoning code titles and definitions of Title 17 and Title uh, 22 respectively start with the following applicability requirements. So includes residential for the de definitions of gross floor area. LA County 22.2.030 applicability of Title 22. This Title 22 shall apply to all properties within LA County, including uh, all uses, buildings, and structures, and land owned by any private person, firm, corporation, or organization, or the county or other local, state, uh, or federal agencies. Uh, Malibu Municipal Code uh, 17.02.020 purpose, the purpose of the zoning ordinance is as follows, to promote the public health, safety, and general welfare by regulating the location and use of buildings and structures and land for residential, commercial, and other specified uses contained within this title so as to achieve uh, the following. Next, okay, no. oh, same slide. Gross floor area is also used to measure for an addition under the adopted LA County and California codes for geologically hazardous areas. Next slide. Malibu uh, Building Code adopts the LA County Building Code, which in turn adopts the, uh, the um, California Building Code in areas that are not specified in the LA County Building Code. However, since there are already definitions of gross floor area in the LCP, MMC zoning and LA County Code zoning, covering more relevant and appropriate jurisdictions of Malibu and LA County. Colin, yes. Your time is up. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe and Colin. Next, we'll hear from Lynn Norton. Yeah. We can hear you, Lynn. Hi, 
Twitter. Now, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Um, I am actually um, speaking tonight to ask you to um, direct planning to move forward with Norm Haney's hotel project and to get it on the planning commission agenda. And I believe that at one of the last meetings, I'm pretty sure I heard all five council members speak in support of that project. And the reason why I think it's important is because it's very synergistic with the issue that you've heard me speak about several times that I'm most concerned about, which is the short-term rental, because um, that hotel project will replace some of the lost, a lot of the lost TOT and also be a more appropriate visitor serving accommodations. Um, so um, we can't wait for COVID to be over to go city projects because we'd be waiting for nine months or more probably. And um, um, another benefit of that project uh, that, that probably most of you or all of you know about, but that maybe a lot of people don't know about is that um, the project will provide, um, repair our ability to receive emergency flow of water. And so timing matters and we can't um, know that we can just in, indefinitely postpone a project and it's still gonna be around for us. So. Anyway, I just um, was hoping that that project would get moving forward. And um, so uh, here's a little note that I wrote down, which is that FYI, um, for every month that this project is delayed, we lose potentially up to $90,000 in TOT taxes. So the longer it takes to get that project going, the longer it takes to start you know, generating revenue from it. So anyway, that's my request. I would hope you do that. Thanks very much, bye. Thank you, Lynn. Next, we'll hear from Vicki D. Good evening, everyone. Um, I was at the meeting last um, a couple weeks ago, and I just wanted to, um, I know you guys said you had nothing to do with it, but I was asking if we could do anything about shutting down the beaches because of the crowds. And of course, now we are shutting them down. So I guess that is a good thing. But my only, my um, concern was my neighbors, we're more um, closer um, to the canyon side and we were just imposed um, for some of us starting at about 50,000 and higher uh, property uh, taxes um, for about 167 residents because after the fire, they have just now assessed us just a specific, just a blanket number for all of us or for the that 167 um, residents. And I was trying to see if you guys knew, I wanted to know if you guys knew anything about that or why was it just for those 100, uh, 167, which are more residents that are on the canyon side as opposed to the water side. And then, and then I was curious as to now, because we have a new mayor, um, did you know anything about the over a million dollars that the, um, the uh, uh, CB, uh, the CDBG draft plan, if you had a chance to look at that plan to see where that money was going to be allocated, and if so, will that money now be held until maybe after the coronavirus where all the residents will have a chance to vote on it or have an opinion, or will we have a say in where that over however million or so um, dollars will go? And then if we know or why the property taxes, I know we have the Proposition 13 that increases property taxes, and I know we're going from about 12% um, to 15%, and I was just curious as to why or what we could do in Malibu to, with, I have a lot of my friends that lost their properties, so why would there be an increase on in property values when a lot of people are just building their properties back up to what it originally was as opposed to it being bigger or um larger than it was initially before. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Next, we'll hear from Scott Dietrich. I'm now unmuted. Um, thank you, Karen, for all the hard work you've put in. I think all the work that you've done makes it uh, clear that we should at least allow people to vote to see if we should have a directly elected, hired, paid mayor. And thank you, congratulations to Mikey. Mm -hmm. I had sent the council and Riva uh, a note with asking five questions, 
and thanks for the responses I got. Mikey cleared up the erroneous charges from waste management that uh, apparently went to residents of Eastern Malibu. Um, Reva told me that on the agenda coming up, I think it's August 11, is Norm's Hotel. I'd ask about that. Um, the, uh, uh, the other thing, though, and I'm asking Reva because she said she would look into it, um, at the last meeting, Mark Pastrella uh, told us that he was going to have a study done by August. Well, my question, and this is regarding the auxiliary backup pumps for Big Rock and actually pumps for the other canyons, but specifically Big Rock because they raised a heck of a lot of money. They've done a great job. And my question is, if Mark indeed gets that study done by August, will that give enough time to fund having those backup pumps so that Big Rock doesn't run out of water? And I'm hoping we have an answer for that tonight. And uh, I thank you. And with that, I'll uh, let it go to someone else. Thank you, Scott. Next, we'll hear from Norman Haney. Yeah. You there, Norm? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay. Well, good evening, Chair Fair and fellow council members. And thank you for your service, uh, uh, Council Member Fair, uh, Mayor Fair, and, and also congratulations on your uh, election, uh, Mikey. So, um, I started working on the hotel four years ago, and finally, uh, I filed the application three and a half years ago. And I've been working very hard to get all the approvals, and I got all the approvals. And I thought I was going to go to the Planning Commission first and then the City Council. I was advised, however, that no, when you have a, a development agreement and an overlay district and a zone change, you first go to the City Council and explain your project and see whether they have any objections to it and what kind of additional benefits. When I say additional benefits, I mean benefits over and above the benefits that are intrinsic uh, with the approval of the project. Um, we had that meeting two and a half months ago, and it seemed as though there was very little uh, opposition to the primary elements of the project. Uh, however, two of the city council members mentioned that they thought the $400,000 of additional benefits might not be enough. So it was, there was a vote. It was articulated by Christy Hogan to send it to the planning commission for a full hearing and to allow the negotiations to continue. Then it would come back to the city council. I was okay with that because my primary goal is to get the project in front of the city council, hopefully approval, um, before November, when we have to go through another city council. Um, I've already gone through one city council in, in discussing this project and, and working uh, to gain their understanding. And this is the second city council, and I really don't want to go through a third city council. Um, I appreciate Lynn Norton's uh, comments. Uh, and so I was very confused when after eight weeks, I finally was able to sit down with um, Bonnie and Trevor and um, uh, Lily, who is the planner. And they were able to get an additional $400,000 out of me, making a total of 800. They doubled it. Um, I had a very special place for, th for that additional money to go, and I explained that to them. And I was shocked when Bonnie said it's coming back in front of the city council. And I said, why? It was actually pushed. It, it was a unanimous decision to send it to the planning commission. Then it would come back to the city council. Well, notwithstanding, uh, she said, don't worry about it. It'll be on the agenda at the next city council meeting. Well, 
she called me back the next day and say, no, it's not even not going to be on the next agenda, nor will it be on the agenda after that. It'll be on the agenda in August. I still couldn't understand why, because it comes to you again, then it has to go back to the planning commission, and then it comes back to you yet a third time. So I'm frustrated, uh, disappointed. I'm sorry, your time is up. All righty. I've got a lot of money invested in this, and I'll be available for questions if you have any. Thank you, Norm. Thank you for your time. Next, we'll hear from Craig Hill. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. We can. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, former Mayor Ferrer, uh, I'll echo the council members' comments and applaud your efforts. And um, new Mayor Pearson, welcome to this brave new world, and I wish you the best and particularly appreciate that you uh, will take a strong stand on STRs and on the Environment Commission and so forth. A couple of things. Um, the generators to keep the Big Rock's water supply during the PSPS brush fire events. It's not the city's jurisdiction, but still we have no clear answers on why Mark Pestrella of the county thinks he needs to study the situation till mid-August. When Dave Reidman and a few neighbors already spec the required system down to the last nut, bolt, and washer, got three competitive bids and the whole thing. So when I brought this to the attention of the city about the logical costs of an impending fire, you astutely identified this as an area of potential liability for the city. And you called up the county and to step up and cover its obligations. And maybe you could follow through again with Mark Pastrella and just help ensure that the purchasing and installation can start immediately because there really is nothing to study. Um, and then I also wanted to comment on Norm Haney's project. Uh, it's been a while since you addressed it. And I do hope it's on the early August agenda uh, at the soonest. You know, I agreed with some that the offered amount of public benefit seemed insufficient, but I do also see the value in the hotel and how the TOT could help plug the hole when we kill the commercialized STRs and the zombification they've brought to our neighborhoods. So um, I, I just wondered how the negotiation is going, if you could clarify, and whether it's maybe time to get more creative about it, either on Norm's side by adapting the project with a somewhat lower FAR, or on the city side, if Norm's immediate liquidity were an issue in these COVID times, as it would be natural, it would be, you could plan for the hotel to pay a few extra points on a periodic basis over time above and beyond the TOT into a public benefits fund for infrastructure maintenance, cultural events, or whatever. Because um, I, I still think it's problematical that the city might trade the exception of such a high FAR for only a one-time benefit. The hotel will be ongoing with a presumed lifespan of many decades. So the public benefit should be structured along with the life of the business as well. And that would create some synergy by softening Norm's front end cost. Maybe he doesn't have to pay any huge amount on the front end while allowing him to happily and painlessly contribute much more in the long run out of his profits. So it, it would also keep the city and the community interested in the ongoing success of the hotel because everyone would have a stake in that. So let's be thinking in terms of some ongoing arrangement and solution as sort of the win-win approach in that. And uh, I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Next, we'll hear from Ann Doni. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity for us to provide input uh, uh, regarding the condition of our city. And I have some specific concerns about our health and safety and also our fire safety as it pertains to um, the beach along Malibu Road. Now, uh, there were some um, news stories earlier um, in the last few months about the fact that the sheriff's department wasn't going to enforce um, people being on the beach during the COVID concern. And that seems to have subsided now, but it still seems like there is no enforcement on Malibu Road. Um, and I have been witnessing some really shocking displays and I'm wondering what our standards even are. For one thing, uh, the parking is totally jammed up. And when people are lobbying for 
are waiting to park or waiting for people to come out. Other cars wait, and then they get so frustrated that they speed around the waiting car really fast. Now, we have little tiny kids on little tiny bicycles here that are riding. It may not, it's certainly not safe for them to do that in the street, but nonetheless, they do that, which is why we have a 25 mile per hour speed limit. But nobody goes 25 except the people who live here. And a lot of the time I've had to jump aside as I've been walking my dog. Um, because they, some of those cars go up to 60 miles an hour right over those speed bumps. And we may need something else to slow those cars down because I'm just afraid to even go out there and walk my dog. Um, so the other thing is, let me see, I have a bunch of things that are really um, concerning to me. So with the, 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 the beach this last weekend was unbelievable. It was so jammed up, um, not just the little pocket beaches with the public right of way that we have along the way, but everybody in front of their house had lots of people there and not just beyond the mean high tide line. I couldn't even hardly get out to the beach myself because there were two or three partying people right on the other side of the, the walkway, the, the um, stairs that go down to the beach. And one of the people who was there was smoking cigarettes. And, you know, we have a lot of dry seaweed under there and we have um, other dangerous things plus pilings. Now, I think that having the hotel here would increase cars, increase traffic. I even saw some man urinating right under the house next door to mine. Um, so I'm concerned about um, I'd like to push that back in the hearings on the hotel into September. I don't think there's adequate time to get into the pros and cons of that. The garbage that people have left when they've it was just crowded with lots and lots of alcohol just sitting on the side of the street. People didn't even take it home. And yeah. so, all right. Well, those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Next, we'll hear from Stephen O'Neill. Am I unmuted? You are. Thank you. I just want to start by saying, Karen, thanks for all the hard work you put in. I know you you stepped into this job at a really kind of uh, difficult time for the city. And, and Mike, I want to say uh, congrats and perhaps condolences to you as uh, you're stepping into another difficult situation. But I, I wanted to uh, uh, take this time to introduce a subject that um, I've been working on through the Malibu Foundation uh, that has to do uh, with some help to uh, some of the homeowners who are attempting to rebuild their homes. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the council for all the work it's done in that regard with uh, from the permit fee waivers to the uh, expedited process uh, we've either suffered or enjoyed uh, in the past couple of months getting permitted. Uh, I'm fully permitted and um, uh, they're doing grading work right now, so I'm on the path back, thank goodness. But what I wanted to raise was a, a somewhat arcane but important subject for a lot of rebuilders, and it has to do with the the city's fixture unit counts for uh, for specifically for uh, toilets. Um, the issue is that um, we have uh, laws that govern uh, the amount of uh, volume uh, toilets can uh, d deposit to a system, and that's a 1.6 gallon toilet. Uh, there's some there's a statutory regime that was passed in. 2009, starting at Civil Code 1101, uh, which really, which basically says that if you have a one point, uh, anything over 1.6 gallon uh, per flush toilet, uh, it has to be removed. And uh, of course, you cannot install any toilets that exceed 1.6. And frankly, I don't even know if you can buy any toilets that exceed 1.6 uh, gallons. However, the city is still using in its regulatory scheme uh, the California Plumbing Code, which has not caught up with that technology. The fixture unit allocation uh, that is uh, used by the city through the California Plumbing Code, the statewide plumbing code, uh, is considering a, a five gallon flush toilet. And uh, accordingly, it allocates six fixture units for each toilet. Uh, given the fact that uh, five gallon toilets are uh, no longer available, uh, they're uh, frankly illegal, uh, uh, I think the city needs to consider or reconsider the fixture unit allocation that it's currently using. 
Uh, again, they're allocating six fixture units uh, based upon a five gallon toilet, which frankly, uh, no one is uh, allowed to put in their homes anymore. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd like the staff, if they could, to uh, take a look at this. I submitted a, a, to all of you an email and a, uh, uh, a brief analysis of this issue. I'm more than willing to work with uh, the staff or the city attorney on, on furthering uh, this exploration, but uh, it's not on, uh, uh, unprecedented. About 13 different cities across the state have recognized this. And uh, frankly, I just think uh, good public policy dictates that the regulations employed by local agencies and cities uh, should reflect the advances in water saving technology. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, conclude my comments and thank you very much for your attention and your time and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Next, we'll hear from Barbara O'Neill Ferris. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, hi, good evening, City Council staff and um, congratulations, Mayor Pearson and thank you, um, Mayor Fair for your hard work and dedication to our city. Um, my husband, Stephen, just spoke and kind of laid out uh, the reason why we're um, speaking in public comment tonight. And I would just like to chime in and say how this is such an important and urgent issue that we really hope the council will immediately address. Many people are still in the planning stage. Oh, uh, I should also um, bring to your attention that we are burnouts. Uh, our home was located on Wandermere. So for the over a year and a half, uh, we've been in touch with other burnout people. And so we're kind of familiar with the issues that many of uh, the burnouts are facing. And in fact, this issue, which Stephen described as somewhat arcane, is in fact a very important issue for two reasons. One is that when you rebuild um, under the pretty much the same footprint, you're limited to the amount of permitted fixture units that existed in the home prior to the fire. This has limited many people whose homes were built in the 50s from uh, building or, or getting the permits to build the home that is more of a 21st century home because we're being, uh, we're being limited by this fixture unit count allocation. Uh, so Im immediately that would help many of us in our design and building homes that are more reflective of the 21st century. The other issue is the temporary housing. Uh, so many people are getting to the end of their uh, a ALE, their additional living expenses. If they don't already, if they aren't already back in Malibu, they're going to have to have some really hard choices to make because they got to live someplace while while the rebuilding's happening. If somebody wants to come back and live in a temporary uh, uh, unit, temporary housing on their property, they would like to build uh, an additional dwelling unit, perhaps a smaller unit that they could turn into an ADU uh, in the future. However, because of the limitations on the total fixture unit count, many people are being told, okay, you can come and um, build a, you know, a, a ADU, but uh, once your main house is rebuilt, uh, we won't be able to give you a permit for that ADU unless you invest in a completely new OWTS to the Barbara. tune to the tune of a hundred grand. So those are the two issues. Okay, thank you for hearing me out. And please, I hope this will be agendized at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Mayor, we had one person sign up after this uh, item was taken up. Do you wanna hear them? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, we'll hear from Kanya W. Um, good afternoon or good evening, Council. Um, it was recently brought to my attention by multiple residents that there was being infrastructure built and a parking lot possibly on the Point Doom Preserve. And I just wanted to see if you guys had any information about that. I know that the preserve was supposed to be preserved and that there should be no infrastructure built on that. And I was wondering what that uh, was all about. 
Um, second off, I'm also um, a resident who was in the fires and has those property taxes that another resident mentioned beforehand. And I was wondering if you guys do something about that as well. I don't think it's fair for just 167 some odd um, residents just to be assessed taxes and clumped together for no reason when there has been no assessor to come out on our properties and actually assess the values of our properties. Um, third of all, I also wanted to talk on the homelessness issue and as well as the uh, population issue. I feel like with the beaches, I know that we're not allowed to close them down because they're not ours and there's the statewide and they have the jurisdiction. But I feel as if with the whole coronavirus thing, we should have jurisdiction to close our beaches down yeah, for our public man. health, as well as not allowing people to come down here and just spread their trash and litter all over our beaches. That's not fair for our residents. Masks, gloves, alcohol, cans, all of it, it's, et cetera, it's ridiculous. And then also I wanted to touch on the topic, congratulations, you know, to Mikey for uh, being nominated for mayor, but it just seems to me that there wasn't really much input from the community as a whole um, for this nomination and election. I don't know if there's going to be anything on a ballot anytime soon or if there was previously, but it just seems a little bit um, non-inclusive of everybody. Uh, thank you. And that concludes public comment. All righty, thank you very much. Um, and we'll get back to, I'm sure some of you when we get to our comments. Um, commission, committee, or city manager updates? Reva? Um, do you wanna hear from Scott Dietrich first or the city manager? Uh, let's have Scott first. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason I signed up under 2B was because when I signed up a week ago to speak, um, I couldn't, there wasn't anything under 2A. Um, I talked to Alex and he fixed that. He saw there was a mistake. So um, uh, you don't need to hear from me anymore. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate that. Um, Reva? Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by um, congratulating Mayor Pearson and Mayor Pro Tem Peak on their new appointments and to thank uh, Karen Fair for her service over the last nine months. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you and I look forward to continuing that uh, now that you're just a regular old council member. Um, so I have quite a few updates tonight. So if you uh, don't mind bearing with me, um, I want to start by saying that we did have a very small one acre fire earlier this afternoon in Carbon Canyon. It was quickly contained uh, by both um, uh, fire uh, on the ground and air and they were able to contain it. Um, my understanding from the fire department is that the crews are still on site, uh, making sure that we don't have any flare ups. So um, good news on that, that they got that out quickly. Um, in terms of our updates on COVID, uh, there were 2,593 new cases reported in Los Angeles County today, bringing the total um, at LA County um, to over 129,000 total reported positive cases with 3,575 deaths in the county. Our numbers in Malibu as of today are 65 positive cases with two deaths. Um, there were new restrictions issued uh, earlier today from the governor. Um, the city has sent all that out and that information is available on the city's website, um, but certainly um, brings to light uh, that we're moving a little backwards, not forwards in terms of the restrictions that are now uh, back in place. Um, and in terms of our fire rebuilds, we have 242 homes uh, that have been approved for rebuilding, one multifamily property that has been approved. We've is issued 122 building permits and we have five homes complete um, and several more that are very close to being complete. So that's good news as we move along there. Um, the Malibu Emergency Survival Guide that the council had asked us to produce um, is complete. It actually was completed um, and uh, printed uh, a couple months ago uh, with COVID. We haven't been able to distribute it. We have several thousand copies available. Um, so if anybody is interested, please contact Sarah Kaplan at the city's main number 310-456-2489 extension 368 and she can arrange to mail you a, a copy. 
Um, we have the nomination period for the November 3rd general municipal election open today, um, and it will close on Friday, August 7th, or on August 12th, if uh, the current incumbent does not file. Um, if you uh, need more information on the nomination process and period, you can contact Heather Glazer, our city clerk at hglazer at malibucity.org. We have our annual street maintenance project, which will uh, uh, be going on. We have paving in the Malibu Knowles area and in the Malibu Country Estates area starting uh, this week. Um, with the Civic Center Way Improvement Project, which was pending on an appeal before the California Coastal Commission on Friday, the Coastal Commission denied that appeal, so that project is able to move forward now. We will be bringing a construction contract to the City Council on August 10th for approval. We had previously gone out to bid on that project, and the contractor has been holding his bid, uh, which will help us in the timing of it. So we're now coordinating with that contractor mm -hmm. on a construction schedule and be able to provide that information out as soon as uh, we have that contract approved. We have set, uh, two uh, uh, LCPAs that are pending before the Coastal Commission. The fire resistant landscape um, uh, item has been scheduled for the August California Coastal Commission meeting and the uh, pesticides LCPA has been the application that the city provided has deemed, been deemed complete, but they have yet to set a hearing date. Um, so we are checking back on, on a regular basis with the coastal staff to find out when that hearing date is set. Some good news uh, for those of you who've paid attention for a long time, you know that the right turn pocket um, is something we had asked for over and over again at Trancas Canyon and PCH. And we've been working uh, diligently with Caltrans. They have an improvement project to the Trancas Creek Bridge. And uh, we held our ground and said that uh, we didn't see that project moving forward with any of the approvals that they would need from the city if they weren't able to also incorporate that right turn pocket into the project scope. And so uh, thanks to Rob DeVoe, our public works director, who just kept at it with Caltrans and did get them to agree to uh, add that right turn lane, even though the width, uh, width of those lanes are substandard according to Caltrans. Um, the city has agreed to fund the improvements of the right turn lane out of our LA County Measure R funding. Um, and so that project will be moving forward um, in, uh, at the same time as the bridge uh, improvement project. And there is going to be a virtual public meeting on Wednesday, July 15th um, from 6 to 7.30. And there's more information available on that on the city's website. Um, but again, a big, big thank you to our public works uh, staff and particularly Rob who really kept at it to get that important turn completed. Um, I'm sure you may have seen um, that Malibu Bluffs Park and the newly opened skate park have unfortunately been closed back down uh, due to COVID. We had had numerous, numerous uh, issues with people not adhering to the requirements um, under COVID-19 um, in terms of social distancing and wearing masks. Um, there are strict rules of the number of people who could be on the skate park at one time. We had implemented a reservation system and unfortunately, uh, people were just not following the rules. They were jumping the fence um, and being very hostile and confrontational to city staff when asked to leave or comply with those rules. Um, and we also have been having a lot of problems with people congregating on the fields, um, playing organized sports, which are not something that is allowed right now. Um, at this time, you're only supposed to be with members of your own household. Um, and so due to those reasons, uh, we have had to shut down the park indefinitely um, until uh, the situation with the pandemic improves. So um, very unfortunate that some people um, ruined it for all the other people who were following the rules, but obviously the safety of the community is uh, the most important thing here. Uh, we were able to open, reopen the community pool at the high school that opened this past Saturday. Um, again, there are um, strict regulations having to do with COVID in place uh, for the pool. And uh, you will need to register if you want to participate either in the Seawolf swim program, the master swim program, or um, lap swim. We are not accepting walk-ups. So uh, please see malibucity.org slash aquatics uh, to make a reservation to use the community pool. 
Um, we have uh, two different um, hearings coming up on the short-term rental ordinances. Um, there's going to be a special planning commission meeting on July 29th to discuss the proposed home sharing LCPA. And then, uh, and we're expecting that agenda report to go out this week. So uh, stay tuned for that. And then we also have a short-term rental interim ordinance that will be coming forward to the city council on August 10th. Um, an update on the locking bid ordinance. We have 44 commercial properties that are now in compliance and have installed their locking bin um, atop as required by the ordinance and the city hall uh, facility also now has a locking bin on in place. Um, Southern California Edison has recently uh, released some new information on their um, power safety shutoff plan. Um, they have some new maps that are out. Um, so I would encourage people to go to the SCE website, which is SCE.com slash maps, where they can get more information. Um, and city staff is participating in some webinars to get more information on what they're proposing uh, for the upcoming season. Um, I'd like to also remind everybody that we were not going to have a city council meeting uh, for July 27th. That's the meeting that the council traditionally goes dark. And so our next council meeting is going to be held on Monday, August 10th. Um, and we do have uh, Norm Haney's uh, hotel project scheduled to be brought forward to the council on that date. Um, obviously, this is a, a big um, matter for the council to decide in terms of what the um, public benefit is going to be for that project. And for that reason, that will be coming to the city council to determine uh, if there are if they are in uh, agreement uh, with what uh, Mr. Haney is proposing. And we have that then scheduled to go to the planning commission in September. So um, I know it's frustrating for all who've been watching that, but we're doing our very best under some pretty trying situations to keep everybody's project moving along and particularly those people who are um, trying to rebuild their properties, that that's our highest priority. Um, in regards to the question about the big, big rock water pumps, I did uh, exchange information with Mr. Pastrella earlier today, and he is in the process of reaching back out to the Big Rock neighborhood and proposing a full review um, of what kind of resiliency can be established in the neighborhood. And the study that he had promised uh, regarding the generators is underway, and he's expecting a report in a few weeks, um, and that, that he has committed that uh, Water District 29 will be able to fully fund the recommendations of the study, including the installation of both stationary and mobile generators. And so uh, just a reminder that is a county, those are county facilities, county property, and therefore anything that gets installed or done is really up to the county uh, to, to do. Um, I'm going to ask uh, in a moment to have Yolanda Bundy speak to the fixture unit question that's come up that I know was posed to the council. Um, but before I do that, I do have an announcement uh, regarding one of our staff members. Um, it's happy and sad news for me to report that our um, wonderful planning director, Bonnie Blue, um, is going to be leaving the city this fall. Um, she and her husband are going to be relocating back to Florida where her family is to um, be with her parents as they get older. Um, I am um, very, very sad to see her leave. She has been an incredible uh, director, um, has led the city through some very difficult times over the past few years, and um, she's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, but I'm also very happy that she's able to move on to another chapter uh, with her husband and her family um, um, at this time. So um, with that, I'm going to um, ask Yolanda to uh, jump on and give us a quick update on the um, uh, fixed account because I think she'll do a, a much better job than I will in explaining uh, what we're doing and how we are abiding by the code. And then I'll be happy to answer questions if the council has any. Thank you. Yes, good evening, City Council, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this regards. Um, there are two basic parts to the city plumbing fixture allowance standards in the city building codes. The first part is the number of fixture units assigned to each type of plumbing fixtures. After reviewing the petition that we was submitted on Sunday, um, the petition uh, cited different jurisdictions that have made some changes to the code. And I went back and reviewed those changes are pertaining to the water meter sizing 
and not to the drainage fixture units, which is the wastewater issue that we're discussing this evening. Currently, city staff is using assigned drainage fixtures, unit values delivered, derived from the California Plumbing Code. As you guys know, the Plumbing Building Standard Commission publishes the California Building Codes. The building codes are the minimum code mandates. It is, these are, um, as a matter of law, the local government and agencies are not able to amend the code to make it less restrictive. So talking about the California Plumbing Code under Table 702.1, which established the drainage fixture unit values, footnote six indicate that the minimum value for toilets is six when calculating for septic design. This is something that we staff regular uses just because all of our city is, uh, has all WTS systems. Relaxing, relaxing such a standard, which will be meaning changing the fixture unit value, would not be allowed by the Building Standard Commission. The second part of the city plumbing uh, fixture allowance standards is the matching certain total number of fixture units to the specific size of the existing uh, septic tank. This is the part where uh, some of the fire uh, rebuilds which they have an existing sec septic tank is, is or, or their remodeling has created a code compliance issue for some, uh, so for some projects. The staff is allowing property owners to maintain the same number of drainage uh, fixtures units that existed prior to the fire. By doing this, um, the city is intending to promote longevity and sustainability for this type of uh, uh, systems. We also believe that this is preventing to uh, have many failures on the existing septic tanks. Regarding the, uh, the comment for, uh, from Mr. O'Neill regarding the, um, the gallons per flush, the state of California under the California Green Building Code is progressively doing a more restricted water conservation measurements. Under this California Green Building Code, with which, which was integrated with the plumbing code, the maximum allowable flow rate is 1.28 gallons per flush. Um, so at this time, the the building code and the building standards, and I sent you guys a copy of the guidelines for amending the code, allows for more restrictive, restrictive local amendments that are reasonable, necessary local to climatic, geological, topographic conditions. I guess I can suggest that now that the state is going under the new code adoptions, we can start writing to the state building commission in this regard and see if they can make a, um, a change on the next code adoption. And that's all I have for you guys. Okay, thank you very much, Yolanda. Appreciate that. And uh, Reva, thank you for your very detailed report. I appreciate that very much as always. And um, Bonnie, uh, that's huge news. And you've, I've known you ever since I've been at the city, about eight, nine years, I've lost track, I don't remember. So I, um, that's big. And uh, obviously you're around a while longer, so we'll get to talk, but I just wanna thank you for your years of incredibly hard work and everything you've done and, uh, and wish you the best, even though I know you're not out the door yet at all. So thank you very much. I'm gonna move on to item 2C, city council comments. Um, Karen, the world's unfair and the way it works somehow, like you come up first now instead of last. And uh, do you have any comments you'd like to share? Sure. Thanks, Mikey. Um, okay, just uh, a little recap of some of the things that have been keeping me busy lately. Um, Mikey and I participated in a mayor's and council members executive, executive forum for three consecutive Thursdays. Uh, which wrapped up this last week and super beneficial covering a lot of items um, that affect us and uh, 
good news, bad news affects pretty much every city. Uh, so those kinds of continuing education programs I find extremely beneficial. Um, we've had several LA County Public Health Department updates, uh, and we all know about the news. I think everyone knows that came out from the state today. And uh, unfortunately, we're going into a whole new round of closures uh, or going back to them because our numbers are going up. Um, I had the pleasure of attending the opening of the temporary skate park, which is now closed, unfortunately. So I look forward to um, our numbers going down and uh, behavior that benefits the common good so that we can all enjoy this facility that everybody has wanted for such a long time. It was such a big deal. I'm so sorry to see it closed. Um, I also attended, uh, along with Mikey, a Zoom presentation on preparation for wildfire and other disaster that was sponsored by the league. And one of the presenters uh, was Reva Feldman, our city manager. So I wanna thank her for her leadership in that. Um, and there are so many things we're doing here, uh, some before Woolsey and some since Woolsey that many other cities are not even touching on. So I hope they're learning um, from lessons that many of us are. Uh, there we, we had a Cal OES, Office of Emergency Systems update today. Uh, a lot of numbers and pretty much a lot of bad numbers. Um, so we really, I think, need to do everything we can as individuals and as a city to get a handle on this, uh, on this virus. Um, I want to give a plug for the census. Uh, it may seem uh, silly. It may seem uh, like it doesn't have an effect on, uh, on our own lives, but it does. Funding is derived from the census. And if you haven't done it, please get a pen and write this down www.2020census.gov. It literally takes between five and 10 minutes. And our numbers are really low. Uh, Reva, Mikey and I have been in communication with um, our, I don't know what we call him, census liaison. I'm not sure what his title is. Um, and he's, he's contacted us again and again, sadly to report that our numbers are really low as a city. So please take just a moment and fill out the census. It's so simple. There's no, um, none of the questions are invasive and none of them identify you personally, uh, but we need counts. Um, and again, that goes back to funding. Um, Bonnie, I wanna say thank you, first of all. You have really carried a heavy load. Uh, you have, dug deep and led the staff in the planning department and worked with the whole community, particularly after the fire. And your staff has done an incredibly remarkable job. And I wanna say you will be missed. So thank you for everything you've done and uh, that you will do until your departure in the fall. It's very much appreciated by me and many others. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, as far as our public comments tonight, um, a few things. Uh, yes, we've had uh, the generators at Big Rock addressed and I too have been asking about that um, since we, uh, I was particularly optimistic after uh, the comments that we got from Mark Pastrella, Director of LA County Public Works. Uh, Norm, I too would like to see your project advance and I want to do anything that I can uh, to get progress there. Um, and yes, uh, the community benefits, uh, the TOT and uh, other benefits to the city are very much welcome. 
Um, regarding comments that we got about enforcement on the beaches and with parking, with trash, uh, lack of masks, lack of distancing, that is something that the city does not control. I wish we did. Uh, if it were up to me, I would be tightening the screws. Um, but that's a county issue. Uh, that's the sheriff and that's beaches and harbors. And anybody who's asking about that, don't think that we don't talk to them all the time about it. Uh, we ask for reports. We push for enforcement. We push for uh, more resources to be put on those things. And yeah, I agree. We need them. Uh, we'd also like people to just follow the rules. So that'd be pretty simple right there. Um, Stephen and Barbara, thank you for contacting us about the fixture count. Uh, and I want to thank Yolanda for her explanation. Um, I think that wraps that up. As far as uh, the two questions about tax assessment, I'm assuming you're in the city. I don't know if you're in the county. But either way, the city of Malibu doesn't determine uh, the, your property value or your assessment. Uh, that's, that's the county. Um, if you want, I can give you a contact there and you can direct your qu question to the person who can answer it. Uh, 122 permits and counting. We really are trying to get people back in their homes and that remains a priority. Uh, I am very happy to see the Civic Center Way walkway or Civic Center walkway project moving ahead. And I thank the Coastal Commission um, for putting that on their agenda and getting that resolved. Um, I think I think that's about that about wraps it up for me. Okay, so thank you everybody again for your kind comments and um, my usual word onward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very recently, Mayor. Much appreciated. Um, Rick, do you have some comments tonight? Yes, uh, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to go straight to the speakers themselves and the comments that they either spoke or emailed to me. Uh, Chris Connolly sent me a thing about uh, the impromptu car shows. I think that's, you know, it's getting, everything seems to be increasing in intensity and the uh, destination aspect of not only Malibu, but the Santa Monica Mountains for exotic cars is, is increasing. And I know they just come out and sort of take over a parking lot. Um, and I think we, we need to address that and figure out some way to get a handle on it because I was working uh, just over the hill in Calabasas and I saw, oh, I think I was a hundred souped up Camaros the other day. They, they met at a parking lot of the closed you know, um, business and then they all freaking hit the road at the same time. And it's, it is creating an impact. And I mean, we, we welcome people to come out here, but we also expect them to not just dominate everything. And I think we got to talk about that. I want to discuss that with the city manager and see if we can try to get a handle on that. Everything seems to be- I, I'm aware of the problem and I have asked staff to look into it to see what we can do. Um, and also I've been in uh, contact with the CHP um, every weekend because they um, have seen a huge increase of road racing and car clubs throughout. Uh, not only Malibu, but the entire Santa Monica Mountains area. So I'll continue to work with CHP. Um, and as soon as I have more information on the car club specifically in Malibu, I'll provide an update. I appreciate that. And, you know, I work with these guys quite a bit. And I have seen them actually being a little more proactive on uh, their countermeasures on dealing with all of these people who come out here. So thank you for dealing with that. Jeff Greer, I got your email on terms of the um generator issue for the water thing you know i left i left a lot of the meeting with um, mark Restrella with the impression that he was going to basically take care of you guys in terms of the uh fixed generator solution for big rock for the fire season but, but the email that you sent me made it look like uh somebody else was saying well you know we'll get the portable ones out there because we know when the psps is happening and i was to remind everybody the PSPS was a big controversial thing 
prior to the Woolsey fire, and there was no PSPS initiated during the Woolsey fire. So, you know, if they're going by that criteria, that that is not going to work. So thank you, Reba, for already commenting on that. In fact, you're engaged on that because I do think it's, you know, this neighborhood is essentially committed um, to fixing it and they're willing to share in the financial cost. And I want us all to stay engaged on that because they've shown great engagement on this issue. And I do think that it is very critically important as we go forward. You know, we're in the same position we were in 1993 and that's unsatisfactory. All right, uh, the f Joe Drummond's comments on the gross floor area uh, issue and that we should be in, in alignment with the LA County code and all of that. I'm hoping that maybe Bonnie can talk about that. And I, I know we're gonna have a little bit more of a robust discussion on item number 4A, but Bonnie, can you possibly have a little comment on that? Are we in alignment with the county on that issue? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. My power went off uh, just out of the blue a minute ago, so I am dialed in with my phone now. So uh, bear with me if I get disconnected or anything. Um, the the okay. issue that um, Joe Drummond has brought up came up when um, the the item on Pietro Chico was before the Planning Commission, and the question at that time was. Um, a distinction between building code language and zoning code language. And um, these two codes have completely different purposes. Um, the question was about, in that particular case, a building code provision related to the size of an addition that can be made to a house in a landslide hazard zone. Um, the question of building square footage for purposes of zoning um, standards particularly in uh, Malibu's code, is related to um, how a building fits in with um, the rest of the, the zoning code. It has to do with visual standards. It, it is not related to structural, how a building is built, or health and safety issues. It's purely an aesthetic um, concern. So the um, Long story short, the city zoning standards are not in alignment with the county building code because they're apples and oranges. That's um, kind of the, the bottom line. Uh, okay, thank you very much for um, articulating that. And congratulations on your longstanding service to Malibu and your new life in the sunny uh, realm of the beautiful state of Florida where I used to be a resident many years ago. Uh, uh, Kenya, I, Kanya, whatever, how you pronounce your name, you mentioned a few things. The infrastructure on Point Doom, I think what you're talking about is they're replacing the stairway that's going down to the beach. I mean, that, that, that old stairway, I'm surprised we didn't kill people on that because it was so steep. So that's been a long time coming. I don't think there's any new parking lot that's coming as a result of that, but I believe that's what you're talking about. They've been, been working on that for years. Uh, I hear you on the close our beaches thing. That would be wonderful, but they're not our beaches. They belong to the county and the state. And that's part of the challenge here for us as elected officials is to try to ensure that the um, huge volume of people that come out to our beautiful town on the weekends and to visit, whether we go to the beaches or driving their exotic cars, that they don't uh, negatively impact our wonderful a rural character of, of our neighborhood. So don't hesitate to bring those issues up to us. We understand them. Um, I think it's, we just have to kind of deal with it. But the, as I said, the intensity of the visitors is increasing dramatically. And I don't understand why all of a sudden everybody has decided that littering is cool because uh, I thought we solved that back in the 60s. Um, and the mayor issue, he said the public uh, didn't have much input in that. The, the mayor is a, he is a first among equals, so to speak. In other words, he has the gavel and he leads the discussions and he's the figurehead, but he's just one of us in terms of being a voting member. We actually vote as to who is going to be the mayor, but I think that we've kind of taken a gentleman's um, approach throughout the history of Malibu to essentially just share the gavel and everybody gets a shot at it. Um, I appreciate your interest and Nobody's trying to leave you out of it, but that's a little background on the way that works. So uh, if you have any 
other comments about that, I'd be happy to hear all those, but just, just a little background about how that works. Uh, and that is it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, Jefferson, do you have comments tonight? Yes. Thank you, Mikey. Mayor Mikey, if I may call you that. Appreciate it. Uh, for the most part, my uh, comments would be that uh, three people other than Norm spoke about his hotel, Lynn Norton, Craig Hill, and Ann Donine. Um, and I want to assure them that they're on the right path with pursuing this hotel project and the, the need for the city to retrieve the financial considerations that we can as a city. I think Norm has come to bat and done a great job um, providing and furnishing what we felt was necessary. I guess the disappointment for me, as it was for many, is that I thought it was a 5-0 vote, correct me if I'm incorrect, uh, and the city attorney said that the 5-0 vote was to send the project back to planning, unless I'm incorrect, maybe Christy can uh, verify it for me or, or clarify for me, but I thought that was the last direction we were supposed to take, that it would go directly to planning. I, I, maybe somebody can clarify why it's back to council, but I just want to let you know how much Norm gives to this community. I'm going to hold up a flyer here, and I hope you can see it. If you can't, I'll explain what it is. Can't really see it, but we sort of yeah, explain it. It's um, at Norm's Hotel on July 22nd. It's being run by the American Red Cross, and they will host all blood donations receiving a free COVID-19 antibody test as well. So for those of you who are following this and want to get some details, you can call Larissa at 818-815-7717. And she has a Gmail address, but it's, I'll try it out. L-A-R-I-S-S-A -S -S dot H-E-A-T-L-E-Y at gmail.com. So that is for your, the American Red Cross. Norm is sponsoring this at the hotel project site. Uh, I suggest anybody that wants to follow up on that, if you can see this now, or you can call me directly and get more information or call somebody at the Cure Spa or at Norm's Hotel site. Thank you. And the last comment was um, for Kanya, one of the speakers, uh, as well as uh, Ann Donine with her concerns about what's going on in the beach with the motor homeless at Corral. I did receive a number of emails and a chain of emails and links with the uh, deficiencies that are are happening there with the lack of uh, health code violations. And that's where the county can step in. So if we look at the health code violations, which is the dogs not on a leash, the dumping of black water onto public property, the disregard for the trash and the behavior of casting it over the side, which I've published many pictures of in the past of people actually throwing their trash over the side into the rocks and using the rock areas to use it uh, for bathrooms. These are health code violations. And health code violations going directly into that water is a federal violation. So there is an avenue for us to enforce this against those motor homeless on Corral Beach. The, the number was up to 24 last night, as well as homeless people parking on private property uh, right next to Cher's house. So we've got to move on this as a council. We've got to start pushing, pushing the screws onto the county to enforce their own health code laws on those beaches. Thank you, Mayor Mikey. All right. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Pete, do you have council member comments? Thank you, Mikey. I'm going to keep it brief and uh, had a, a Clean Power Alliance board meeting last week. Um, don't really have anything to report on that. Um, I want to, again, thank Karen for all of her leadership. I know one thing, you know, for both you and her, I think at the time it's known that when you guys got elected, the city kind of just went into turmoil. It was very difficult for a lot of people. And I think both of you really stepped up and I'm looking forward to be your, uh, your, uh, mayor pretend as some say <laughs> for, uh, the next uh, few months here as we head into the fall and, I just really want to 
um, say that I appreciate everyone in our community right now that's obeying a lot of the restrictions and wearing masks and everything else um, just when they're out and about. And I know that there's obviously a lot more limitations that came back into play today. And I just think as a whole, we're going to get through this and it's going to take time. So I just appreciate everybody uh, respecting that. And that's what I got. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Bertin. Much appreciated. Um, for my comments, a lot of the speakers have been addressed. The one thing I wanted to bring up is I think Skylar and I had talked last meeting about agendizing to at least talk about the view preservation fee. If I'm correct, it's never even been done. And maybe I'm wrong on that. I don't remember it ever being done. Maybe it has. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we want to talk about that. It does, does seem very expensive. It's never been done. It's a little, does seem odd. So um, I don't know, Skylar, if you still want to see if we can bring back back to at least chat about it. Um, but yeah. yeah. I don't know if, Reva, is that something that we can, I don't know if there's consensus from everybody to do that. I'd like to have a, have, we can have a discussion about it because it seems like it's something that's frustrating a few people. Um, so if I might just jump in, um, in August, we'll be coming back with some discussions about the budget. Um, the council asked us to come back. And so that might be an opportunity for you to discuss, discuss the fee schedule at that time. Um, if, if you'd like, or we can bring it back as an item, um, um, separately from that. So at, when the budget comes back, can we discuss that item as it's part of the budget or how does that work? Yes, because there's an implication if you're going to change the fee that there's going to have a budget implication. So we can certainly add that as one of the items to discuss. Have people paid the fee before? Not that I'm aware of. Um, when it's gotten to that point, um, from my understanding is that uh, neighbors have been able to work it out amicably and there hasn't been a need for the city to step in. Okay, so, but it would be appropriate if we bring it up then for a bit of a chat. Um, That's okay, thank you very much, Reva. Um, hang on a second. So, um, you know, this is, this is unprecedented times and we can all feel it. We can feel it by the comments and the speakers, uh, our own comments, what we're witnessing in this town. This is, this is hard. We're all out of our, minimally, we're all out of our patterns. Um, and changing patterns is very hard for humans. And I think it creates a lot of anxiety and stress. And I get it. I get why people are stressed. There's, Financial hardships, our businesses are suffering, our, our recreation is suffering. Our town is so crowded certain weekends like last weekend. It made July 4th seem like just a vacation for Malibu residents when it wasn't filled to the brim with cars and racing and all of that. So I just want to acknowledge what a tough time this is and let you know that we are in a lot of communication with the county, the county health director, uh, the, the mayor of LA, our supervisors, we are very engaged on these issues and, you know, we won't give up. It's, it's, it's tough. There's no perfect answer. Um, just to repeat what's already been said, we follow LA County health department regulations, which, you know, it's, uh, we don't have our own health department. So that's what we follow. And, um, that is under the county of LA. And so it's hard. It feels like sometimes they don't have the ability to fine tune their orders that fit our town. And that's, that's difficult. And we have discussed this with them in various ways. And I think the skate park is a great example of that. I mean, I've waited my entire life for a skate park in Malibu and it comes and opens on Friday, July 3rd, you know, and so many people were so excited and we all knew it was a challenging time. I was there at the opening and I was really actually impressed. There was a lot of space and just a few skaters and it looked like this was going to work. And, and then just like the rest of America, just people just, they're just pent up and they can't handle being at home all the time or just everything going on. And next thing you know, it starts to fall apart. And I get it, I understand it, but it's really difficult. 
Um, and I want to acknowledge that I, I was on and I know Karen was. We listened to the school town hall online last week. And I have to commend the school district. They did a great job at outlining what their thoughts were and how to go forward on educating our kids. But I don't think anyone came away from that meeting with anything but just the weight of what we're going through and the weight of what these kids and our teachers and the parents are going to go through. I don't know how we do it, but our community has to find a way to rally around these families and these kids going forward because it looks like it's going to be a really different and difficult year for these kids. And um, I feel for them. And um, there's no good option. And any option that they pick as far as education could change at any moment. And all the while, it's time to prepare for fire season. We're in fire season. Um, I put out a video on that last week, and I appreciate all the positive comments. But at the city level, we are doing a lot. and We're going to be getting information out more and more as we go forward. The city has not stopped on, on its fire preparation, but us as individuals have to also take responsibility. We have to be ready at home. We have to have a plan. We have to be ready on ready, set, go. We have to harden our homes. We have to take care of our landscaping. Um, there's so many different things we need to do. Our neighborhoods have to join together. Um, you know, my neighborhood has a fire brigade. It's, you know, a different kind of commitment. A lot of us joined Arson Watch after the last fire. There's another kind of commitment. A lot of people have taken CERT classes. There's another commitment. So there's a lot of ways that we all need to be involved, but sitting around and kind of just hoping no fire comes is not a plan. I fear very much for Big Rock. They think they're right in the bullseye. I worry for them. I understand the need that they want to get water up there. I worry about them staying during a fire. So I, I find I manage to worry about that either way. Um, so, like I said in my earlier comments, there's lots to do, and it's um, it's there's, there's a lot going on. Um, PCH has always been our number one priority, and it still is while we are in a pandemic with huge fire disasters and climate change and sea rising sea levels. It's, it gets a little convoluted. Um, I will say, though, I was happy. I had to drive out. It was my mother-in-law's 92nd birthday on Sunday. So I was on PCH, regretfully, for a little while. It was an absolute madhouse. So um, I saw the sheriff and CHP pulled over multiple car club people and were giving them tickets. So they were out there doing what they can. But the honest answer is, we, you know, it's going to be hard to stop all of this. It's hard to stop the amount of people coming to Malibu. The amount of people at Zoom on Friday was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, there was a line of traffic from west of Morning View to Canaan to go out of Zuma in the early afternoon. It was like like the most crowded weekend you've seen, and it was a Friday. So interesting, difficult times, and um, just know that we are truly working really, really hard and not taking anything for granted, not letting anything through the cracks as best as possible. Um, Norm's building, I already talked about that. Yes, I'm glad it's coming forward very much. Um, to repeat what Karen said, please, please, please fill out the census. We are way behind as a town and it'll hurt our town. If you want to help Malibu and you want to help us be strong and healthy financially, do the census. Please go online at www.2020census.gov and just do it. It only takes a few minutes. I did it and then they called me and I talked to them and they wanted to clarify a couple of things. It was easy. It was no big deal. I've... Um, Beginning um, a number of emails on people very worried that 5G is coming to Malibu. Uh, we're going to have a report on this at our next meeting, as I remember, August 10th. Is that right, Reva? You can just nod yes or no. Yes, she's uh, nodding yes. Um, so I know a number of people are very concerned about it. I'm unaware that it's coming to Malibu, and I was on the Planning Commission for years and talked to, and I've talked to the cell phone companies, or a couple of them, so I don't believe it is, but yet I understand the word. Um, and um, 
one last note here, or two last notes. I'm still on the weekly call for the California mayors, the coalition of mayors. And um, it's not just Malibu. <laughs> Every city in California is really, really, really under a lot of pressure and feeling the same strains in their own area that we are. So it's um, it's been a it's been a tricky time. And one last shout out, or not maybe last shout out for our local businesses. We're still doing the zero percent loans, and we have funded a nice number of loans. And I know a couple of people are applying right now. These loans are very flexible. If you want to know more, just get a hold of me, um, call me, text me, email me, whatever. I'll be glad to go through it for you. But this could, if you have a small business in Malibu, this could be the thing that helps get you over the hump. So I think that's all I got. I believe most of the speakers were addressed. So um, thank you very much. Let's move forward. Let me get to my agenda here. Okay, now we're on to the consent calendar. Do we have any items already pulled? Do we know that? Pulled by the public. Say again? Nothing has been pulled by the public. Nothing? Wow, I think that's the first time in a while. That's uh, I'm not used to that. That's why I had to ask you to repeat that. Um, City Council members, do any of you want to pull any of the items on the consent calendar? Seeing nothing, do we have a motion on the consent calendar? I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Can I get a second? Okay, I have a motion and a second. Can we get roll call on this, please? Mayor Pro Tempik? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Ferrer? Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Moving on from the consent calendar, we are coming to item 4A. This is appeal number 20-003, appeal of planning commission resolution number 20-11 at 33608 Pacific Coast Highway. And um, can I have a report, please? If you're talking, Bonnie, you're muted. You can just bear with us for a moment. Bonnie was having some internet problems yeah. at her house, so. I think, can you hear me now? Yes, we oh, can. Oh, great, okay. All right, sorry about that. Um, let me that. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, congratulations, Mayor Pearson. And uh, the next item before you is an appeal of a uh, project at 33608 Pacific Coast Highway. Um, that was denied by the Planning Commission and is before you now um, based on the uh, applicant appealing the decision. The next slide, please. The site is located uh, just west of Decker Edison Road on, along the shoreline. It is accessed by um, a private driveway that serves several homes, as you can see here in the slide. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, a, uh, a zoomed in version that shows the existing house and the detached uh, second unit. We can refer back to this um, aerial at another time if we need to. 
The project proposes a remodel and additions of enclosed area to the second floor Ooh. and um, covered decks to the first floor. It also includes a site plan review for a flat roof that will be 24 feet in height. Next slide, please. Um, this project was originally submitted in 2017. Um, on February 18th, the staff recommended approval of the project. The Planning Commission directed staff to um, come back with a resolution denying the project and at their March 2nd meeting adopted that resolution. And then, as I mentioned, the applicant has appealed the project. Uh, next slide, please. The Planning Commission denied the application based on two different findings. The first one is that it, the project did not comply with the two-thirds rule, and the second was that the project has an adverse impact on neighborhood character. As you probably remember from previous discussions we, we've had with you, um, neighborhood character is one of the findings that must be made in order to grant a site plan review. Next slide, please. Regarding the first uh, finding, the Planning Commission um, read the code differently than staff has been reading the code for many years um, in terms of how the two-thirds rule should be calculated. The Planning Commission um, read the code as calling for floor area or gross floor area rather than total development square footage to be used to calculate the two-thirds rule. Um, Gross floor area, though, is a commercial development standard, and total development square footage is the standard that is used for residential structure size. Next slide, please. The two-thirds rule um, appears in both the local implementation plan of the local coastal program and in the zoning code, and it falls in the total development square footage section of the code. The purpose is to require articulation of buildings to avoid an overly boxy structure um, so that you don't have the same mass on the top as it is on the bottom. Um, in a nutshell, the second floor should not be two thirds more than the size of the first floor. Next slide, please. Um, in the municipal code, the language is slightly different, but still talks about the wording of second floor area shall not exceed the exceed two thirds of the first floor area. And this is where the planning commission um, got their reading of the code from in terms of um, using floor area rather than total development square footage. Next slide, please. This is the definition of floor area um, that is found in the code. Um, as you can see from the definition, it calls for measuring from the interior face of exterior walls, which is completely different from how total development square footage is made, measured. Also, um, gross, as I mentioned, gross floor area is, um, is a, used in commercial development standards, not residential development standards historically. Next slide, please. Um, so, the applicant's appeal of the Planning Commission's first finding contends that the Planning Commission incorrectly applied the two-thirds rule in violation of the local implementation plan and the municipal code and longstanding policy, and that the project actually complies with the two-thirds rule. Next slide. This is the calculation based on total development square footage, not floor area, as we discussed in the staff report. So here you can see the maximum size of the second floor is allowed to be two thirds of the size of the first floor. So that's 2,435 square feet of total development square footage times two thirds gives you 1,623 square feet. The proposed square footage in, of the second floor for the project is 1,622 square feet of total development square footage. And that's how the um, conformance of the project was determined. Next slide, please. Um, this application of the code is based on longstanding policy going back in writing as long as 2008. And actually, um, aside from a period during 2007, it was in place even prior to that. And I mentioned in writing because the, um, there is a zoning interpretations manual that is available on the city's website and available at City Hall and is referred to by staff and applicants in, in term, uh, for purposes of 
um, understanding how to apply the code when the code isn't crystal clear, which is unfortunately pretty often um, on a number of issues. So this is an excerpt from a 2008 memo, which explains city practice and intention um, going forward um, to include specifically square footage of covered areas and total development square footage when the covered areas extend more than six feet from a structure. And here in this project, um, the uh, addition of covered patios to the first floor as total, de total development square footage is used as a strategy to balance out, not balance out, but to make um, the massing of the structure work for purposes of the two-thirds rule. Um, this practice was vetted through the uh, zoning ordinance revisions and code enforcement subcommittee known as the RACIS back at this time and the memo was presented to city council. Um, so it, it was vetted and um, this just goes to show that this is not a, a secret practice, it's not a new practice and it's not one that staff made up and um, just put into place without um, vetting. Um, we don't have any record of staff having used floor area to calculate the two thirds rule um, and not count covered porches. It was a specific goal of this interpretation to um, make sure that uh, applicants were not able to add as, you know, it's so much extensive covered patios that it would violate the spirit of the two thirds rule and the TDSF standards. So, it was an intent, an intentional um, policy to make sure that covered areas were counted in TDSF and um, used as the in the two thirds rule. Next slide, please. Let's see here. Okay. Um, the applicant prepared this diagram, which was Exhibit G to the staff report. Um, it's a simplified illustration of how. Uh, the, it shows you graphically how the project complies with the two-thirds rule. Um, here, the first floor, um, which includes the covered patios, or the total development square footage, is shown simplistically in yellow. And the second floor, total development square footage, is shown in green. So um, as shown in the diagram, you've got the existing on the left and the proposed on the right. You can see how a completely boxy structure is avoided and the massing of the building is articulated. And this is how staff determined that the project complies with the two-thirds rule. Uh, next slide, please. And appeal item number two um, was the applicant uh, disputing the Planning Commission's finding of adverse impact on neighborhood character. Um, next slide, please. The Planning Commission found that building square footage proposed was significantly greater than what was shown in the county tax assessor records uh, website for surrounding properties. This, if you read this in the abstract, it, sound, it might sound a little strange because there's nothing as we also, this is another topic we've discussed with the city council in the past. There's nothing in the code that defines what constitutes neighborhood character. And there's nothing in the code that defines what the boundaries of the neighborhood are. Um, so, um, but in, in recent years, you will remember that um, building size has been a focus uh, among many of the planning commissioners and a big concern among some council members. Um, and so to evaluate this finding, um, staff began including a table showing the um, square footage as provided by the assessor's office um, as an exhibit to the staff report to avoid a situation where planning commission would continue a project in order to get information on the size of houses. Um, historically, staff has looked at size, bulk, and height and considered issues like whether um, the project meets the code, how the part over 18 feet affects the neighborhood, whether it affects views, and that's how the findings were made. Um, but in the interim, um, absent more um, definition about neighborhood character, staff began including information from the assessor's office 
um, but included a caveat on the table to explain that the, um, the, the assessor's information square footage is not the same as total development square footage. Um, what we found is that um, the, the assessor's information addresses typically habitable structure, but would not consider or would at least um, call out separately accessory buildings or not include at all things like garages, whereas total development square footage includes all those things because its, it's concern is with um, the overall development on a site. It isn't related to taxation or those sorts of issues. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just kind of showing a comparison of how TDSF and the assessor data are um, apples and oranges and not a, a reliable metric. And next slide, please. I think we're a couple slides behind, I apologize. Uh, next slide. And next slide. Okay, so the proposed total development square footage um, for this project is uh, involves 2,913 square feet of enclosed area plus 1144 square feet of covered porches um, and then two detached accessory structures for a total of 5,390 square feet. The house itself is 4,057 square feet. Next slide please. When you look at the um, average of the neighbors or not neighbors, but the properties within 500 feet, that's what we typically show. The average is 3,716 square feet of habitable area as shown in the assessor's data. And as you can see, um, that is less than, or the proposed project has a smaller house than um, what is in the neighbors or in the neighboring area. And certainly the square footage would fall within the range of the surrounding area so that if you, if the focus for neighborhood character was, is on house size, then this project would, it could be found to be within the range of, of what is common in the neighborhood and not, not adversely impacting it. Um, we received two uh, pieces of correspondence which were distributed to the council. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we had correspondence from Craig Hill and correspondence from Joe Drummond. Um, I've partially addressed uh, Joe Drummond's comments earlier um, as in response to council member um, Mullen. Um, if you have additional questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. But um, in, in basically, as I mentioned, the issue of a building code definition and the zoning code definition are, are not related. Um, one can um, it, it one can have something to do with how how a building gets built, but the building code is related to structural um, integrity and the zoning code is related to aesthetics. So that that's basically what I'll say about that. Um, Mr. Hill had a lot of comments about um, the Planning Commission's deliberations and expressed a lot of opinions about um, um, what the what he felt the Planning Commission's um, intent was. He he's one he was one commissioner on the board though, so it should be noted that the commission's actual uh, election is a, is memorialized in the resolution. Um, I'll just go over a few things that Mr. Hill mentioned and then I'll, I'll um, close my remarks. Um, I've covered the two thirds rule and the community character questions. The lot size, uh, Mr. Hill appeared to be looking at the wrong lot um, on the assessor's information. The lot size used by the applicant and by staff for evaluating the project um, is lot 10 and is a smaller lot size than um, what Mr. Hill was pointing out. The project does comply with TDSF based on the lot size. And just as a side note, um, staff relies on a survey um, 
as opposed to the assessor's information. And again, that is because the assessor has different reasons for including or excluding information or um, areas from a parcel that may or may not be consistent with how the zone code um, calculates uh, building square footage and things based on lot size. So that's why we relied on the survey. Um, Mr. Hill mentions that square footage associated with the revetment should be excluded from the lot area. Um, this was brought up in the Planning Commission meeting, but um, as I mentioned at that time, um, a revetment is a, is a shoreline protective device. And like a seawall, um, we wouldn't exclude a structure from it sits on the lot from the lot area. So that's why that was not counted. Um, I think at this point I will uh, close my staff presentation and um, I know we've got public comments and uh, a presentation by the applicant as well. Um, I'm available for any questions and Lily Rudolph planner is also available. Um, so uh, that concludes my remarks. Staff uh, recommends adopting the resolution and um, approving the CDP. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate that report. Uh, council members are going to do disclosures now. Um, Karen, do you have any disclosures on this item? Sorry, had to unmute. Uh, I've had one telephone conversation with Doug Burge, and I've received correspondence from the attorney on this that I know was sent to all council members. Uh, and that's it. Did you learn anything new from those? No. From the staff report? Not in the report. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rick, any disclosures? Uh, yes, I also got the same email from the lawyer, which contained a phone number for Doug Burge, encouraging me to call. And I did. I called Doug Burge and had a conversation with him over the phone about this. I also, on my own, contacted um, three of the planning commissioners, uh, Steve Earing and John Mazza and uh, no, four of them, actually. And Craig, well, Craig Hill is a former planning commissioner and Chris Marks, just to get their perspective on their thoughts on, uh, you know, the deliberations that went on. But I didn't, you know, I didn't learn anything new that wasn't in either the correspondence that I got from uh, Craig, which has already gone over by um, Bonnie, as well as the staff report itself. And uh, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jefferson, any, any disclosures? Yes, thank you, Mayor Mikey. Uh, I did receive the same email from the attorney and uh, from the appellant, uh, the reach out to, from Doug Burge and Associates. Um, I never made contact with them. Uh, it's been busy for me at the retail store. Uh, I did visit the site. Uh, I took pictures with uh, my unit here and um, walked it off. Uh, I didn't learn anything new. I just felt it was valuable to visit the site and see the uh, house that was being done up above. It's a larger home uh, and it was valuable, but I didn't learn anything that isn't already in the text that has been provided by the, the staff. Thank you, Mikey. All right, thank you. Uh, Mayor Purcell, now, I also wanna add, Mikey, that I did go to the site too. I didn't actually make it onto the property. You know, I was on PCH and I couldn't gain access to it. And I really wasn't able to see that much from PCH. So you didn't learn anything from that visit? Okay. Jefferson? You have to go down the driveway to the left, and there's a gate code there, and uh, it's right near the red pilaster. But, yeah, you can still see, you know, above, down, but you can go down the driveway and see a better shot. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Pete, do you have any disclosures? I do. So I, um, I spoke with the architect for the project, um, as well as uh, Planning Commissioner Maza, and um, I've also visited that area, um, that house uh, with the previous owner um, many years back, but I've also spent a lot of time on that little cove by the beach there. And I know that the property is not really visible from the highway, but it's definitely visible from the beach. Um, 
So that is just something I would add. And Anything outside the staff report you learned? Not other than the perspective is it, you know, if you're gonna see it, it's only from the beach. It's not really from anywhere else. Okay. Um, and for myself, I had a conversation with uh, James Arnon and Arnon and Doug Burge and with John Mazza on this subject and did not learn anything that has not been written up in the staff report. Um, next, the uh, appellant applicant team may present. You have 15 minutes and you may save any time for any possible rebuttal from other speakers. Um, are there other speakers signed up on this item? Yeah, uh, outside of the applicant team, we have Joe Drummond, Colin Drummond, Craig Hill, Beth Gordy, John Maza, and Norm Haney. Okay. But the applicant team will go first. Okay, thank you very much. And now you get 15 minutes, correct? Yeah. Okay, an applicant, you know, I see Jim is raising his hands there, or his hand. Um, let us know if you want us to save some time, um, or I don't know if more than one person's talking. Um, Jim, can you hear me? Yes, now I can, thank you. Okay, uh, are you doing all the talking, or are you, do you have a team? Uh, Doug Burge and I will speak. Okay, do you want us to save time for rebuttal, or how do you want uh, to? Yes, please, we'd like to save five minutes for rebuttal. Okay, perfect. All right, um, you're up. Good evening, I'm Jim Arnone of Latham & Watkins, representing Michael Price. Uh, Mr. Price and Doug, his architect, spent years planning and coordinating with city staff for this relatively modest remodel and addition. It's an existing single family home, and this is a relatively modest remodel, as staff explained. Mr. Price and Doug worked hard to make sure that this followed the city rules. They followed the interpretations that have been in place for a very long, long time. So Mr. Price and his team were surprised when the planning commission voted uh, narrowly against the staff's recommendation to deny this addition. We've appealed and we're here tonight asking that the council uh, follow the planning staff's recommendation and that you grant Mr. Price's appeal and let him proceed with this remodel that he's been working on for a very long time. Oh, I see that my slides are not up. Uh, could the clerk put my slides up? Ah, thank you. Next slide, please. As Doug's gonna show you in a moment, this home complies with the two thirds rule. The city's residential development standards have always calculated structure size based on total development square footage. The two thirds rule says that any portion of a structure above 18 feet high can't exceed two thirds of the first floor area. It's been the city's policy as Bonnie explained since 2008 and even before then to count covered areas that extend more than six feet from a structure toward the total development square footage when calculating the two thirds rule. That includes covered porches like this home has on the first floor. So this house is consistent with your LCP, the municipal code and longstanding city policy. Um, the first floor's TDSF is about 2,400 square feet. That includes its covered porches as was explained. Two thirds of that equals about 1,600 square feet. And so the second floor was designed to do that to fit right within the rule. The planning co uh, commission erroneously calculated the two thirds rule using the idea of gross floor area, which as Bonnie explained is a commercial development standard that doesn't apply to single family homes. The city's long interpreted first floor area in the two thirds rule to refer to the area of the first floor and ne never to the gross floor area. So applying the total development square footage and the process the city has used for many rear years, Mr. Price and his architect team relied on this and the home complies with the two thirds rule. Next slide, please. As Doug's gonna show you more visually in a moment, uh, the house remodel and addition is not going to harm neighborhood character. It'll blend in very well with its surroundings. As you already heard, it's not even visible from public rights away. You have, can see it from the beach, of course, but you can't see it from PCH. Um, the commission respectfully, in our view, got it wrong by comparing this home's total TDSF to the average habitable area of the surrounding homes shown in the assessor's records. And that's just apples and oranges. As Bonnie was pointing out, the assessor's floor area information is simply not the same thing. 
as the city's TDSF measurements for residences. It's not intended for the same purpose. It's not the same thing. Assessor habitable area records don't include garages, covered patios, and other accessory structures. The assessor floor area figures are very different than TDSF for any built residences because they don't purport to measure the same thing. Like the staff report shows, Mr. Price's home is going to have a TDSF of about 4,000 square feet, but its habitable area will only be about 2,900 square feet. This isn't a huge home. This has a habitable area of just about 2,900 square feet. That's significantly less than the average habitable area of other homes within 500 feet, which average about 3,700 square feet, uh, which is about 800 square feet bigger than Mr. Price's home will have. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Doug to show these concepts visually. Uh, and next slide, please, for Doug. Can uh, everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, good evening, commissioners, um, uh, city council members, excuse me. Doug, I pause your time. Yeah, it looks like you're muted, Doug. Um, there you go. Can you got me on there now? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, yes, good evening, uh, council members. I'm Doug Birds. I'm the architect for the project. Um, we were also the architect for the previous owner. Um, and then when Mr. Price approached us a number of years ago, he wanted to do a modest addition to the house. Um, we went over the rules. We went over what could be done. Um, we knew what we had the rules to work with. As you know, I've done many homes in the area. And there are strictly, you know, three things that make up the two, two, two thirds world in creating the massing. It's the livable area, it's any garages and any covered porches over six, six feet. It's been that way for years. And I didn't make up the rules. We work with the rules and that's the way we designed this house. The owner didn't want to go through any variances. He wanted to keep a clean project. Um, the slide that we have in front of us, it's basically so, uh, superimposed pictures. The one on the left is the, the house that was existing, is existing now and the one on the right is the proposed project. So just looking at these things, um, basically the remodel design we think is clean, it's supporting the modern house, and it definitely works within the two thirds rule. Um, let's go to the next slide. So again, we felt that the house itself is, you know, the neighborhood's a little bit eclectic. We got Harry Gesner's house on the right. Uh, in fact, he designed the other house right on the beach. Um, our house, again, is made up of two separate buildings. One's a guest house building, um, and then the other one is the main house building. The main house being only two bedrooms, two and a half bathrooms. Um, we did not increase that. We just wanted to make some bigger bathrooms. I mean, excuse me, bigger bedrooms, a little bigger bathrooms. And then we added a small home office. So no additional bedrooms were made. Um, so again, a modest sized house, as Jim explained, around 2,900 square feet adding about 366 square feet, which are located on the landward side of the project. So um, it's kind of tucked into the hill on the right-hand side. And so any of this addition could not be seen, you know, really any kind of impact to any kind of neighbor. There's about eight homes that share this driveway. So we've done a few of them, but we felt this house was very much a house that was in um, character with the whole area and it did not have any issues with neighborhood primary views. And certainly it was two stories like everything else. Let's go to the next slide. So again, just looking at it as a footprint um, of the house um, in footprint and in matching is nothing really to say that it's back to anything larger than any neighborhood has. And we feel like this project complies 100% with the code and the code is written for purposes of designing a home and hiring an architect and working within the rules. And that's something that we've definitely complied with. And with that, I'll give it to Jim. Hi, can you hear me? I've got muted again. We can. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Next slide, please. Um, in closing, your staff report, it was very detailed and got it right. 
Mr. Price's house remodel complies with the two thirds rule. It's exactly the way the city has interpreted it and implied it since 2008 and actually before 2007 as well. It fits the character of the neighborhood. It's smaller than two of the nearest homes that were built in recent years. We ask you to grant this appeal as staff recommends and approve Mr. Price's house. We're reserving the balance of our time and thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. They have, you have seven minutes and 30 seconds left and uh, can uh, we bring forward the speakers now? Next, we'll hear from Joe Drummond. Hi. Um, I'm just going to talk on what I was talking about before. From the MMC 17.40.040 residential developmental standards, it says, not withstanding any other provision of this chapter, the total developmental square footage for a structure greater than 18 feet in height shall not be greater than permitted for single story construction. The second floor area plus the area of vaulted ceilings above 18 feet in height shall not exceed two thirds of the first floor area and shall be oriented so as to minimize view blockage from adjacent properties. So there's no mention of TDSF in the two third rule, only floor area in the measurement. It looks like from the pictures Doug Burgess had that there's some other homes on the beach that have gotten away with breaking some rules for structure size. City Council should clarify that the Malibu code being used to measure floor area or gross floor areas, both residential and commercial as agreed by the Planning Commission, despite what planning interprets incorrectly. This has nothing to do with building and zoning codes being apples versus oranges, which they really need to be aligned, so this doesn't make sense. TDSF is not an accurate measurement for the Project Two Third Rule, but gross floor area more conservatively is, as the Planning Commission has already determined. The top floor in item 4A would already be too big by 400 square feet given its current box shape if, the defini if this definition is used. Without the covered balconies, the first floor is 1291 square feet and the second floor is 1256 square feet. The two-third rule was made to avoid its current box shape. Habitable, habitable area should be used, which is made up of gross, by gross floor area by Malibu definitions. So it states in this item for a application of gross floor area for evaluating residential products would be inappropriate without direction from city council and proper noticing to amend the LCP and MMC to revise the method by which the size of residential projects is calculated. So city council must clarify an absolute definition of gross floor area that conforms with the requirements for residential structures within the zoning ordinance. When we incorporated and became a city, we adopted a municipal code that included a zoning code, Chapter 17 of Cities MMC. This should be applied for both residential as well as commercial as per the applicability purpose code set forth and apply to the building code as the planning commission has done in this case. Next slide. LA County Code uses the term loading spaces even though it's applied for both residential as well as commercial products. So that should not be a reason Malibu City Planning applies MFC and LCP zoning codes for commercial properties only as they state in item 4A on pages two and three. Nowhere in the code does it state this is slowly for commercial development. Next slide. All three of these code definitions for gross floor area fall under the above applicability and purpose. Thus all cover both residential and commercial. LA County says all properties within the unincorporated area of Los Angeles County at Malibu LCP states in chapter 1G to ensure that any development in the coastal zone preserves and enhances coastal resources. Oh, so, that's yep. your time. Okay, Colin will go. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, MMC, um, MMC 17.02.02 purpose. The purpose of the zoning ordinance uh, is to promote the public health and safety and general welfare by regulating the location and use of buildings, structures, and land for residential, commercial, and other specified uses contained within. Uh, Malibu Planning Department also states um, in item 4A on... Next slide. Oh, next slide. On uh, page two, incorrectly, that gross floor area is solely for the calculation of FAR or the floor area ratio when it is clearly used in calculating 
an addition size in, an, in a geo geologically hazardous area. See below adopted LA County and California building code and not mentioned in its definition is its sole use for FAR. Why should the definition be used for a gross floor area in this case below be different than the Malibu zoning codes when LA County uses their own definition that we stated before, 110.2.3.4? Uh, when the proposed work involves an addition or additions to an existing structure, but is not a, a change in use or occupancy in such work does not increase the gross floor area of the structure by more than 25% of the area of the structure as it existed on July 6, 1968, when the building official determines that the proposed work will not impact a historically active landslide. Next slide. Please confirm tonight that the MMC and LCP zoning codes are both residential and commercial, and therefore the definition of gross floor area is measured from the interior face of the exterior walls and excludes any garages. Therefore, this item 4A must be sent back to revise your plans to this code. TDSF is not an accurate measurement for the project two thirds rule, but gross floor area more conservatively is as the planning commission has already determined. As stated before, there's a consistent problem in the planning department and their interpretation of codes regarding gross floor area. Zoning and building codes should be consistent with one another and address the purpose stated set forth in these local codes, not apples versus oranges. Please clarify or create a residential definition of gross floor area in the LIP and MMC to revise, clarify the way residential project size are calculated. It should be consistent with the current MMC and LA County code set forth as discussed and confirm that the existing code definition gross floor area covers both residential and commercial code. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Craig Hill. Hi, um, I might need a few extra seconds because I must first call out an administrative matter. I must ask that Mayor Pearson recuse himself as it's the project over which he dismissed me. The word on the street is that Doug Burge asked Mikey to dismiss me then, then brag that he'd fixed the planning commission, that it wasn't about me so much as it was about Mikey being the most persuadable council member. Now, whatever the exact truth, Mikey did express strong disagreement with my vote on this item, indicating a definite bias, so can't vote objectively. On to the substance. Bonnie is correct. I picked out the, uh, the wrong lot on the map when I was looking at the tax assessor. I'm wrong about that. I'm right about everything else, all the other points, any one of which is fatal to the project. The riprap, you do have to count that area. It's not a feature on the land. It's a significant change in the topography of the land. It's several thousand square feet that was not included in the total lot area and needs to be subtracted because it's less, it's one to one. So you have to subtract that. And so your total TDSF is lower than the proposed project. Um, now the two thirds rule, the staff report is largely non-responsive. The code just says you measure the floor area of the structure. Staff invokes TDSF, but that's in a different sentence about a different matter. This is basic statutory interpretation. You read the sentence as plain English. You don't look somewhere else unless necessary. Here, if the code meant TDSF, it wouldn't say floor area or of the structure. Certainly a patio is not a structure. And so all that, all that stuff about TDSF is a red herring. Their interpretation produces the absurd result that you could keep adding to the second story. As long as you kept pushing out more deck to cover ground floor patios, you could have one room on the ground floor and a hundred rooms upstairs. That's obviously not the two thirds rule. Doug's diagram shows that the open areas on the ground level are enclosed deceptively. Um, and staff concedes their approach isn't formalized, which is to say it's ad hoc. The memo that Bonnie showed was not ever formalized. It was like, we need to do this, but nothing was ever done. And it's not usually a problem because most applicants understand the intent of the rule. So they measure the floor area inside the structure, not outside on the patio. And there's no need to invoke commercial FAR on any of this. Bonnie conceded that in her presentation. If, if you want to call it floor area comma gross, that's fine, but it's unnecessary because it's obvious that when you measure floor area of the structure, you measure the whole thing. There's no need to change any definitions or talk about the county or any of that other stuff. Just read the code on the two-thirds rule. It's very simple. 
A neighborhood character, we considered various factors holistically, not the way the applicant says, uh, confusing the habitable area with TDSF. That wasn't the issue. I heard from a disturbed neighbor. We focused not on the average of the 10 assessor numbers, but on the mean, which is 745 square feet smaller than the average, 2971. Okay. Uh, Greg, your time is up. All right. Thank you. I understand that Beth Gordy is actually part of the applicant team, so we'll move on to John Mazza. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, greetings. Uh, for the record, I sent each of you an uh, email uh, that is you did not include in the record. I have copies of the email with no bounces, and it's dated. I hope you read it. Um, now, staff, and I took all my responses out of the staff report that you got tonight. And the staff says, on the two-thirds rule, how the floor area, the first and second floor, is to be measured is not defined in the code. That's a direct quote. Uh, the, and then it says the applicant includes 365 square feet of additions of the main residence on the second floor and 796 square feet of covered decks on the first floor. So in other words, not a single habitable area square foot was added to the first floor. Now, as you understand, uh, bulk and mass, as Bonnie mentioned, is what is considered the reason for the two thirds rule. Her, uh, her memo of 2008, never mentions not one word about the two thirds rule. It was about limiting the size of decks, covered decks, not the two thirds rule. Uh, the, the planning commission spent a lot of time studying this, going over the rules because they are very vague. And we determined that the purpose of the ordinance was bulk and mass. And that, as I said in my memo, if you put a hat on your head, it doesn't make your head smaller, okay? Uh, so what happened here is the architect just added a deck to be able to make a cube out of the building. This is not what the two thirds rule requires. And this is not what the planning commission found. And they deliberated this based on the codes. So the planning commission spends hours on these items and they deliberate them and they look for the best way to follow the code. In this case, they did. And you will notice that in the second half of the argument, the second finding, the staff cleverly reduced the size of the building. So it would fit the two thirds rule on the first argument for, I mean, it would fit the uh, neighborhood character on the first part of the argument, they made it bigger. So when you add a deck around a building, you don't reduce the bulk and mass. Um, and as Mikey will probably remember, I cannot think, I've been on the Planning Commission a long time. Never, ever, ever have we considered a, a project where the architect added a deck so he could put covered decks, so he could put more space on the first floor and create a cube. It is not a standard practice. It's never been done before, as far as I know. And the, two, the 2008 memo had nothing at all to do with the two-thirds rule. And there's not one word of it in there. So I hope you give the Planning Commission a little credit for um, supporting this. Thank you. Um, last is Norm Haney. Okay, now can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I'm very familiar with this cove. I've done a number of projects in this area, and I'm not here to argue about the zoning, but the fact is that there are six homes that can only be built on the beach here, and the zoning is incorrect. It ought to be beachfront. If there's only one place to build, and you have to build a seawall in order to protect your house and or your, your uh, wastewater system, then it's on the beach. Now, getting down to what we're talking about, I do believe that there has been other projects 
where uh, a person has, uh, well, actually, every project that I'm familiar with, if you're over six feet, if your if your uh, cover uh, over your deck extends over six feet, they include that as part of the floor area. And uh, so I think the project is consistent with the code, at least the way the code has been interpreted in the past. Um, but when you get right down to it, how is the neighborhood affected if none of your neighbors can actually see your house? And the only people that can see the house are people that are on the beach. And the people on the beach can only see your house if you give them permission to walk there because there, there is no uh, lateral easement on this property. Um, so those are my comments. Um, I, I think uh, the project is consistent with the development standards and I think we have to be consistent. If, if uh, the planning department uh, wants to change that, uh, they have to bring that in front of the city council and have city council uh, change the way in which the planning uh, department and the planning commission has interpreted these codes in the past. Thank you for your time. And now we can go back to the applicant team. Thank you, Heather. Jim and Doug, are you there? Yeah. You know? There you go. Very good. Thank you very much. It's Jim Arnone again. Uh, just briefly, I uh, wanted to point out that our revetment is at a slope of 1 to 1 1.5. So it actually is shallower than the 1 to 1. Uh, that is uh, in the record. It was in the, the file that was before the Planning Commission. Notwithstanding that, as Bonnie mentioned, uh, it's it's not been city policy to delete revetments from lot area. So it I don't think that's especially critical to begin with, but it has never been city policy or practice that they would go and delete the revetments from the lot area. Um, about the question of how this gets calculated and the interpretations, I would respectfully ask the council to refer to a common sense principle of fairness here. And coming off a bit on what uh, Mr. Haney was just, was just saying, it's only fair to homeowners to be able to rely on longstanding city interpretations. If you've got a rule that is widely understood, widely applied a certain way, you spend years and a lot of money hiring an architect to design a house that meets the rules. You spend the, the years it takes to process a project through the city. You have, you're, you're in it very deep and you followed all the rules exactly the way everybody has told you they're applied, the way they've applied for a long time. I could understand if somebody disagrees. I could understand if somebody might think it might be better to do it differently. But that is the sort of thing that fairness dictates would happen openly in a public process, maybe with a code change, and only applied prospectively. Mr. Price has been working for years and has invested a lot of money and has purchased the finishes to be able to go and complete this remodel, not really ever expecting that he'd be in this position. When you are following the rules the way they've been applied for a very long time, you don't anticipate that there's a possibility that you can suddenly find yourself uh, in the position that Mr. Price finds himself here. So we would urge that, I, I don't think you've heard anything here that, that disputes that this has been long-standing city policy. This has been the practice for many, many years. And respectfully, Mr. Price did everything right. He did, he followed the rules. He was very careful. And Doug and his team designed a house that complies with the rules. So we'd be happy to respond to any questions if there are any questions. Uh, otherwise, we appreciate your time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's all the speakers, right, Heather? It is. Okay, so we're back here to uh, the council. Um, comments? City councilors? I can't really see anyone. We got. Yeah, thank you. That's much better. 
Oh, actually, wait, before we start, um, Trevor, can I chat with you for a second? <clears throat> yeah. So Mr. Uh, Hill made a claim that I should have to recuse myself over some story involving that this is a house, the reason I dismissed him from the planning commission. Um, I don't know. I just want to make sure that I don't remember. I don't think there was one reason to be honest. Actually, I know there wasn't one reason I changed my mind on that. Um, I don't, I, this might've been the night that I decided to move on. I, that's possible. Um, yeah. I just yeah. want to well, address this issue and make sure where we stand and just, you know, yeah. sure. We can just say, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the record, you don't have a disqualifying, disqualifying conflict just based on your decision to replace your appointment to the planning commission. You have the right to remove or, you know, appoint at your discretion there. So um, I haven't seen anything here that would, um, any evidence of a bias in, in the record that we have so far before us. If there is something out there that you haven't disclosed, um, you can let us know, but uh, just replacing him as a, as a planning commissioner would not require you to recuse yourself in this situation. Okay, thank you. Um, to the counselors who wants to go first, who wants to talk? Any Jefferson? Okay, I'll start first whack at it because uh, it'd probably be a deep one for a few minutes. Thank you very much, Mayor Mikey. The uh, complexity of this is now uh, evidenced. You have a, a brilliant architect who's very successful here in town and uh, a strong team and an advocate for this uh, Michael Price's property. However, we also discover some of the deficiencies in our codes and our municipal code and our LIP. And these are things that <clears throat> as council members, we have to realize that if there is a deficiency, you should probably identify it and deal with it. However, we as council members have to think about the future and what we leave behind in the way of uh, practices. And if, for me, I find the difficulty here as uh, probably Michael Price has found and Jim Arnone, uh, as well as Doug Burge, that the interpretations are very fluid. And they change as the, we change the colors of our, our shirts every day. I mean, these are things that we find it difficult to deal with. I'm finding it difficult to deal with. Um, I identified uh, a couple of, in my own elaborations of what the staff said, and Bonnie had mentioned that, yes, it's going to be a difficult thing. It's, uh, this is in the appealable zone. Uh, but for me, um, I find that the, the, the compound itself, um, although well-designed and architecturally and visually pleasing, um, I think there we were taken advantage of. And it may be because we haven't done enough work on the LIP and some of the interpretations we should. Thank you, Mikey. All right. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, Rick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I got a bunch of stuff. Um, okay, gray area, as pointed out in the staff report, and uh, John Miles have brought attention to this too. It says on page five, how the area of the first and second floor is to be measured is not defined in the code. So, you know, that's probably something we need to wrestle with for the future so it can make it clearer. Um, it should be, if, if these people who are doing a project, if their intention is to stay in the lane and, you know, have a clean project, which is what we want them to do, really. We want them to stay in the lane. So it has to be clear what the lane is. That's probably something we should chat about. And I'm actually quite interested in hearing what you have to say about that, Mikey, in terms of using these porches and stuff like that for TDSF. On the one hand, there's a, there's a tendency to say, Oh, well, they're just using a porch there to, 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 you know, do the first floor. But that counts against their TDS up. So, you know, I have, a, I have a question is if that enclosed or that open area that's counted as part of the first floor was actually enclosed, 
instead of being open, would this comply? And if so, why isn't it enclosed? Is there something impeding uh, the ability of them to, to actually make that all enclosed? Because it sounds like the, that's, the, that's the dodgy bit here, is the, the first floor has, uh, and it's counted against them apparently on their total, total uh, development square footage, legitimately. So if they just enclosed it, would they, would they, would that satisfy what the planning commission think about? This some just, I want to get the ball rolling there for people to think about that. The other thing is, you know, if we, if we say yes to this without clarifying, um, the whole issue of what constitutes the first floor, we have to kind of think about the precedent and the law of unintended consequences, et cetera. This is something for the applicant or the appellant, I should say, to think about, because I would like you to answer it, not right now, but a little later, is, is there something impeding your ability to make that whole first floor enclosed? And if so, that's what I want to know. Not to answer that right now, but when we get to that, what do you think about? Um, let's see. And Bonnie, I appreciate you talking about the history of the whole uh, covered deck thing being involved in the TDSF. And I heard I heard that from somebody else. And I, is there a truth to the um, contention that that sort of clarification came about because people were just making massive uh, open patios that weren't in club included in the TDSF. And then afterwards they would just enclose them in to make their houses bigger. Is there any truth to that? Is that where that clarification came from? Including, you know, essentially open uh, areas in the TDSF. If you could answer that now, that'd be great. Bonnie. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, a covered patio is a structure and it does contribute to the, the visual massing of a building. Um, and some of the patios, we would see things with, you know, very heavy timbers and, um, you know, substantial roofs. It could be a, you know, a pitched roof. Um, there, there was a side, kind of a side issue with people after the fact enclosing them, but just in a more general, you know, not assuming the worst, but, um, just in general, because those kinds of covered patios do contribute to the massing of a building, if people could just add that type of um, ancillary structure to their building, you would get structures that would far exceed what you know the structure size limits under TDSF intend. And um, it there was a, that experimental period for about a year around 2007 and then the results of that people kind of went bananas and so it was decided that covered areas should be when they exceed six feet because you know you get eaves and there is a certain amount of overhang that's beneficial from an energy efficiency standpoint and things like that you don't necessarily want to exclude um, the intent was to formalize an interpretation that would or you know, better yet, do a code change. Um, unfortunately, we never were able to follow through. There was um, that was one of the items that was on the long list of things to address during a, a full scale comprehensive code update that Joyce Parker Bozelinski wanted to undertake, and it just got really, really complicated, and um, it, that never moved all the way forward. So that's why we we are still operating under this memo. Okay, so that other question that I had, which I want the appellant to answer, but maybe you can answer. So if they did enclose the whole first floor that they're, mm -hmm. that is counted in their TDSF, it was, if that was all closed in, would there be a problem? And if, if, is there something impeding their ability to do that? I'm just curious. Yeah, that if, you are you're correct. It would count. It counts against their TDSF. So um, yes, ordinarily it could be enclosed. I think the applicant should address their design choices about that particular issue, okay. um, because th I think there were some reasons why they elected not to do that. But um, yes, it it is 
something that could ordinarily be done with um, a project that has covered porches? It's uh, so. Is there anything having to do with you know proximity to the ocean or the beach or something like that that uh, is inhibiting their ability to actually enclose that whole bottom? Floor? I believe that is. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that they should do that, but I just want to point out that if it was enclosed, apparently it would comply with the truth of drill. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Again, I would I would defer to the applicant, but I believe it did have to do with um, the the setting there with the flood elevation and things like that. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll be interested in hearing that. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Um, and the other thing, let's see. Uh, you know, the applicant says, you know, it's longstanding policy, or I think actually you said that, um, longstanding policy. But is it an actual policy? I mean, is it, is it that you, that they use, you know, I know you say you included the TDSF, but do you find many projects like this where they're doing the two thirds thing and they you got a bunch of open area on the bottom? It it is it is definitely this has been used as a strategy for complying with the two thirds rule and it's been done over many years. It hasn't been um, discussed or scrutinized in this way prior to now, but it does that's no indication that it hasn't been um, used in this way because it counts as total development square footage and because the two thirds rule is in the total development square footage um, part of the code, um, that's that's the reason. But yes, it has been done before. It, it um, If you ask different applicants around town, they will tell you that they know that that is a, a way that they can comply with the two thirds rule. If people have total development square footage available though, very often they, prefer to have it as enclosed space. Um, and so they will, if they want an outdoor area, they will often um, have a patio with a trellis roof that's open to the sky that would not count against their um, TD, TDSF. So that's why it's in more limited circumstances because typically people value the um, enclosed square footage. Okay. Um, let's see. You know, I, this whole Two thirds thing is supposed to make it not look boxy. I have to say that it looks kind of boxy. <laughs> you know, when I see the picture, uh, the artist rendition of the thing, and it looks like a lovely house there by the beach, but it does look kind of looks kind of boxy. And the diagrams don't really look like a two thirds thing. It looks like more of a three quarter or a four fifths. I'm just saying that you know the intention is not to look boxy. It looks kind of boxy to me. The other thing is, and I just want to throw this out there. I this is a tough, this is like a tough one to do because when I look at these things, I try to, I always would look for the, you know, if something stands out and it just goes like, what's wrong with this picture? You know, this doesn't fit in with the neighborhood. It's just, a, what are they smoking? Thinking that this is going to fly. And I don't, and I hear the technicalities of the, um, the planning commissioners, et cetera, but you know, it doesn't seem like, it seems like the additions that they're putting on aren't even pushing it out toward the ocean. It's kind of pushing it back toward the trees, mostly not necessarily impacting the visual, you know, as Skyler pointed out, the, the place where you see it from is from the ocean. It doesn't seem like the additions that they're putting on are increasing the place where it really is visible from, which is the ocean. It seems like they've built most of the addition is on the back side of it. So that's just an observation from what I've seen. Um, let's see. And you know, the other thing, pardon my ignorance on this, but uh, so the TDSF thing does apply, but it sort of seems like it's on the beach. What What's the deal there? I mean, I thought that, you know, the beachfront guys don't have to do that. Is that because it's not quite on the beach or how does that work? Well, this is something that we are addressing for clarification, again, of longstanding practice in the city um, through a code amendment because it, it does need to be clarified. But the, um, the longstanding practice uh, in the city has been that when a lot is zoned rural residential, the non-beachfront standards are applied to it. And that is because typically the rural residential lots, even when they touch the beach or the shoreline are the larger bluff top types of lots. And so um, 
we took an interpretation, not an interpretation, but a proposed code amendment with some language to address this to the races. Um, it's probably been a couple of years ago. You might remember that it's on your work plan as one of the items that we need to address as a code amendment. And this is this is the reason because it it isn't automatically obvious why if a property includes a shoreline, would it not be um, allowed to have beachfront standards? But if you think about some of our larger or even not so large, but still um, bluff top lots, if, if they were allowed to have beachfront standards with unlimited TDSF and um, five foot setbacks and unlimited impermeable coverage, you would end up with quite the massive um, <laughs> development. So okay. that makes sense. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, education there. Uh, I'm going I'm to hog the mic here. I'm actually interested in hearing what Mike Pearson has to say because you've been in the trenches there in the um, planning commission. You know, have you seen projects like this where they had these deck things on the first floor? Oh, yeah. I'll get to my comments in a minute. But uh, Jim wanted to answer your question, I think. Did you want to? Did you want to? Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Jim, and that's, so the main question is, is there something impeding there, you know, in closing that whole bottom floor? There you go, Jim. Hi, uh, thank you very much. It's Jim Arnone. Uh, uh, yes, there is actually, Councilman. Uh, there's a floodplain issue that in an extreme storm and event, one of those hundred year storm events, there could be an excess of flooding down in the flatter area. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible ever to find a way to do it, but the hoops we'd have to go through and the challenges of being able to determine that that would be safe to add more to the first floor made it be just not feasible to provide to proceed that way. And so that's why the uh, additional enclosed area is on the second floor. And the second floor will be entirely supported by its own structure. Uh, so it's it's uh, doesn't have the same issue. OK, uh, you know, thank you for that clarification, because I, I sort of suspected that. And yeah, it sounds like the Planning Commission is. Hey, those guys are making their second floor bigger than it can be by just adding this, uh, you know, essentially open but covered deck area or something. But it still counts against your TDSF. So I and I think that's a dilemma here. That's a that's a dilemma. So I mean, what is what is considered the first floor? Is it floor area? Is it TDSF? That's the gray area. So maybe what we need to do when we come out of this this evening is provide some, or at least set something in motion for clarification. Okay. Um, thank you, Rick. Uh, Sky, one, uh, Sky let us hand up first, but either one of you can go. I, had a, I just had a question, which is kind of in regards to the zoning stuff. Um, Norm brought it up in his comment. Rick just touched on it with Bonnie. The the argument like here that's made for why this lot should not be beachfront is something I, I, that I would understand would apply to something that would be a, a significantly larger lot, like a bluff top lot. Mm -hmm. However, this and the adjacent properties very much strike me as being beachfront lots. So is that something that was an error that was made when these were zoned? Or is it that like a lot of like unlike the eastern end of Malibu up on the western end, you know, there's definitely some significantly larger properties and bluff stop stuff. But this doesn't seem like it's on a bluff. This seems like it's beachfront. Mm -hmm. Um the the zoning was in this the city zoning scheme predates my being at the city. Um, this, but my understanding is that it was done intentionally where um, the, you'll notice that all the lots around this are zoned rural residential. And so the idea was to, where you've got these small clusters of smaller lots, encourage them to merge or do um, other things like that to over evolve into a, a larger sort of a lot that um, fits better with the, the area around it. Um, but yeah, that's something when we bring forward the amendment that the council could certainly talk about and we can bring you more research on that. I want to be very clear. I'm not advocating for them to all be larger houses there. I think that the, 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 the house size is well suited to the lot and I feel that fits well amongst the neighboring properties. 
Um, while this house may, may be a little bit larger in terms of square footage, I think that when you look at it, although it's white, with some of the neighboring properties, while one of them kind of disappears, the other one's right in your face and it's long and narrow, pushed out even further. So I don't, I just was curious, you know, about that zoning and where that came from. And I very much understand that that predates your time. So thank you for uh, explaining that. Sure. Recently, Mayor Karen. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll, I'll quote what Norm said. This project is consistent with development standards. Um, and then piggybacking on Jefferson's comment, uh, where he said there were deficiencies in the code. I, I think you might have meant discrepancies, but maybe you maybe you could use either word. Um, if there are discrepancies, uh, if we do see, uh, Bonnie called them apples and oranges, but but if if there's work to be done, then let's consider that. But I don't think we can change the rules in the middle of the game on a project that was submitted in good faith. And I've seen it, we've all seen it more than once uh, where uh, teams have worked to comply. And I'll quote my planning commissioner, Jeff Jennings, who said, there are projects uh, now where architects don't know what to tell their clients. Uh, the planning department staff doesn't know what to tell uh, architects and, and builders. And, and that's not a good way to work. So I think we need to look at the current standards and consider this project in that context and if we need to do more work in the future, then let's talk about that and agendize that at some point in the future. But I don't see us trying to cobble together some kind of a new code on our own over this project. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to quote John Mazza from his comments tonight. The rules are vague, and that's, if you're on the Planning Commission, you experience it long and often. The way I've often looked at it is, looking at the code, there's three things about the code. There's the words of the code itself. There's the interpretation of the code, which is past, present, and future. And then there's the uh, intent of the code, which sometimes can get lost as the decades go by. So... Our decision should on this one based on the two the two items that it was denied on the two thirds rule determination and uh, neighborhood neighborhood character on the two thirds rule John and Craig and they and Joe they may be right on the words and the problem here is though on this determination is that it has been established what the policy is. And it's in print from 2008. And yes, I actually want to talk with Bonnie about how we can clean it up. I think it's the MMC that needs the cleanup. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Um, that would be a good starting place, but we, we need to make sure that they track together so that we don't have conflicts. Yeah, going over the language of, uh, I mean, it was the LIP, now I forget. It's uh, been a long night. But there is an area where it talks about TDSF as it's, and then at the end it goes to floor area. That is confusing. That's mm -hmm. totally confusing. And in this case, I think it really comes down to the fact that uh, I think Karen said it. This has been the practice, whether we like it or not, for 12 years at this point, and actually longer, except for a brief year where it wasn't. And there's a memo on it. If we don't like the code, let's change it or clean it up. But it, on the fly, it's not the Planning Commission's job to change the code. And at some point, they have to know the difference. A lot of you have been around a long time. And this is 
these appeals are gumming up the works. It's it's slowing everything down. It's not helping anybody. You're you're creating a system where only the rich can even afford to attempt to build in Malibu. And I urge you to stop it. Help us clean up the code. Don't make it up on the fly. It's not working. It, it's 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 just not working. On the neighborhood um, character, same thing. Recently, you went to uh, not approve a house that had over 20 letters in support, none against. Another one over 30 letters in support, none against. But still, some of you voted against it. Your definition of neighborhood character is seriously in question with me. I may not like the house personally either, but if the neighbors vote for it, I don't, I don't understand where you get, you can make that determination. I really don't. We are here to serve the public and it's not about serving ourselves. So I'm urging the planning commission to really consider and ask questions about what the code standard is. And if you don't like it, let your city councilor know and we can bring it forward and start to fix it. And yes, some of that's been in process way too long. We know that there's other rules. The TDSF rule, rule on beachfront property is gonna bite us in the ass soon when somebody brings forward a 19,000 square foot house, we don't have really a good reason to deny it. So we have real issues on the code. I agree. I agree the code is too gray. But I'll go to Karen's point. We can't change midstream. It's just not going to work. There's no basis for it. And you guys, a lot of you have been around long enough to know that. So I, I don't see any way at this point to, and it doesn't matter what my feelings are on this project or at all, but I don't see any way that those two items can remain. And, but I will add one thing. Neighborhood character. I, I am questioning that, that item that you denied it on. When you look at that photo of that neighborhood, I don't understand how you can say this doesn't fit into the neighborhood. I, my eye goes to all sorts of other houses there that are way outside of what I'm seeing on that property. So I don't know if you didn't visit the site or what's going on there, but I, I don't understand it. And I urge the planning commission to really, really work at helping residents build houses here and not, and not delay it. I'm not after building mansions. I don't care for mansions at all. We're making a system that is broken in my opinion and is not doing a service to this community and it's creating where only multi multi millionaires can even attempt to build. I think it's discouraging. So I understand their frustration. I understand that they would like more clarity. I get it. I'm with you on that. But let's work on that. And let's not work on, I mean, if we're going to look at every word as opposed to how it's been, how it's been judged on for over a decade. We're never going to get a project through here because we already know the code is gray. So let's let's work at, at moving forward. And those are my comments. And uh, I see there's more comments, and then uh, we'll see if we can get a motion. Um, Rick, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to agree with one thing you said about the neighborhood character thing. That photo was rather compelling, to be honest with you. It doesn't appear that this project, which doesn't really change that much from the existing project visually. I don't think it's really, and there are, <laughs> there are some other nearby houses that are definitely stealing the what's wrong with this picture thing. <laughs> so to me, it doesn't really seem like it, it's negatively impacting the neighborhood character. Um, but I'll disagree with you guys a little bit on the hey, you know, this is the way we've always been doing it, so we can't stop midstream. Well, a lot of times that's, you know, why people get elected or why we became a city, you know, is to stop those way we've always been doing it. So don't feel like the human element and the judgment call uh, doesn't um, carry weight. It does. That's why you were selected to come here and uh, represent the people. And if you feel that, and I'm not saying that that's true in this case, but uh it's not necessarily, hey, we've always been doing this, so we got to keep doing it. There are times when you've got to say, what does it say in writing? 
And what exactly does that mean? And maybe we've been giving away the farm for years. I don't necessarily think that's the case here because I think it is gray in terms of the, uh, and I understand what the, what the planning commissioners are saying. They're saying, hey, you know, you can't, he can't build habitable space greater than X here. So he's adding it onto the second floor and he's getting around it by putting in these unenclosed areas on the ground. And the, the builders and the architect is saying, hey, we can do that because those things are included in the TDSF and it is gray in terms of what constitutes the first one. I think that's actually a fairly compelling argument and I can't really throw too many stones at that. So I think based on, on that and the fact that it doesn't really jump out at you as really altering the character of the neighborhood that much. It's it's hard for me to really uh, say that this thing is is way out of line, and that's what I look for. Is that it's way out of line? If it's really, it's like, oh my god, what is what is what is what are they doing the neighborhood here? At the same time, I want to say this, and it's a little bit of a counter to what you're kind of saying, might be is I appreciate the hard work that the planning commissioners do. It's not easy. It's not an easy job. You know, you've been, you did that for a long time. And I think that they do have to bring a lot of their judgment um, to bear in it. And I really hate to go against them when they, when they say that something isn't, uh, doesn't pass the, the test. Okay. I really don't like to go against them. And it's hard for me to do that because I think that they're really on the front lines between the major battle that is not, which is overdevelopment versus preservation. They're on the front lines. So I sympathize with them. And I just want to say to them, because they're probably watching, is that I appreciate all the hard work that they do. And a lot of these things do come down to a judgment call. I don't, this one doesn't really jump out at me as, as being way out of line. I, I, I don't, I don't have a problem saying I see no compelling reason to go against what the planning commission uh, has, has said. And I've done that in the past. I think this is not the case here. We're trying to get, and they've done a very good job. I want to say this, and you right here have been part of this. You guys have done a very good job of getting the craziness inside the lane inside the lane and people are still being able to build big projects but they're visually like they're supposed to do they're not impacting the neighborhood etc and i think i would it appears to me that these people have tried to do that they've tried to do that and um i don't think it's way out of line so anyway those are my comments at this point thanks rick uh i just want to comment back quickly uh I agree, the planning commissioner. It is hard. It's hard work. Absolutely, it's uh, it's it's difficult for sure. Um, and yes, we are elected to bring change to the city for the better and move things forward. You're absolutely correct. And I remember in this case, I'll bring in a conversation you and I had when I was a planning commissioner, and when you and I talked, and you ran, and I didn't run, and and uh, kind of went that way. And there was a large house up on. I don't know if it was Via Sarah or on Canaan. I think it was on Canaan. And I, I was surprised that it got passed. It was like 10,000 square feet. And I asked you about it and you said, well, you know, some are going to sneak by till we fix the code. So the code is important in how it's interpreted and it's history because you can't spend years and then have, just have somebody get caught in the middle and change it that way. You're right, we have to fix it. We have to fix it the right way. So I, I think that's our challenge and it's not easy. Um, there's a lot of codes we need to fix um, and we have to find a way and a path forward to making those changes and I hope we can join together on that because it's a big job. So, um, Karen? Thank you, Mayor Pearson. Um, I just want to piggyback on uh, to both of your comments, yours and Rick's. Um, yeah, Rick, we we don't want to do things just because they've always been done that way. I agree. Uh, if you look at uh, 
things that have been in the news recently. There's a lot of things that have been done for a long time that are not right. Um, but again, it, what I think needs to happen is if, if we want to consider changes that we work with deliberation and consider revisions, bring those forward, not, not try to again, cobble it together on any particular project. Um, and the other thing that's happening is that we have uh, impacted resources. We have a, an austerity budget. And every time something like this happens, we're draining the resources of this city to do other work that needs to be done. So projects with no variances that get put on the planning commission's agenda and then get denied and then get appealed to us are really not a good way for us to be working. So I just want to point that out. And I, and I hope this does not happen on a regular basis anymore. Thank you. Uh, Jefferson. Thank you, Mikey. I appreciate that. So let's look at the cumulative impact of uh, projects like this. We have deficiencies in the, in the way we write things and we interpret them. We have things that come to the planning commission and then come to the council. Look at these projects and the time and the expense that we're putting out on them is because oftentimes there are really smart people knowing how to take advantage of a situation and uh, move with their clients through that. Maybe it's up to the architects to say, hey, this is a questionable area. Uh, maybe we should relook at this before you have to hire an attorney the overall impact of this is in the Coastal Commission's eyes. This is in the appealable zone. So no matter what goes on, there's still a higher court than us. If they keep seeing these things come forward um, and look at us as a council and say, you're not following the LIP, you're not following your own municipal code, eventually, and I, I predict this, maybe years from now, they're going to come down and say, you folks need to clean it up. And without doing that, we're going to clean it up for you. If you look at two weeks ago, we 5-0, we, uh, we approved a project. It was a large bluff top project. It seemed to make sense. The big issue there was view shed. We did overlook it. We overcame it. We voted 5-0 to promote this or allow this big, large bluff top project. Hey, okay, that seemed reasonable. But when we keep having to interpret and conjugate and try and feel these things out, eventually the big brother above us is gonna tell us how to do it and when we're gonna do it. I just wanna leave that as the last warning for a lame duck council member. Thank you, Mikey. Um, is anyone ready to make a motion on this? I'll hear from Skyler. Sky, what do you got, Mayor Pro Tem? I will make a motion to uh, grant the appeal approving the post development permit for the remodel of this home. I was hoping for a little conversation about your uh, observation. Yeah, of, of the, have this. a conversation. Is there any, can I get us? Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, um, Bonnie. Um, let, let me ask a question here. Is this this? There is some definitely gray language in here that is not helping at this point, obviously. Do we have, is this anywhere in our pipeline of being cleaned up or is this something that we can figure out a way to bring forward towards cleaning up? I don't want to try and get too into the granular end of it right now, but I, I you know, we don't want to end up here on something because I, I understand the frustration on the words and all of that. And, in the, sh in the short term or the, the fastest term, my uh, suggestion would be that we update the interpretation and um, we can bring that to Zeresis, um and publish it with the in the interpretation manual so that it'd be available to everybody. Um, and then the longer term, we can look at um, code amendments, um, including the LCP if necessary to um, tighten everything up related to that. Okay, and I think uh, Jefferson, to your comment, you made a comment on uh, the language of the code. I think it's like 
for me, the dividing line on this one is that there has been an interpretation of what it means. It's not a hidden thing. It's actually an open, it's actually in print. It's still the words of the code are gray, but there is actually an interpretation. If there wasn't, this would be a different conversation tonight, I think. So, um, Trevor, I see that um, you want to chime in? Yeah, I just want to get clarification. Is uh, What you're looking for is interpretation that um, it's TD TDSF, which is measured for the two-thirds rule, or yeah. that it's the covered areas that count as TDSF. They're, they're separate areas that should probably both be cleaned up. The measurement being done in TDSF has been done for a long, long period of time. The covered area was a long period of time, but it had a, a carve out. Are you looking to clean up both of those or is that? Uh, Give me one, one second. I, I got notes all over the place. Um, it was, can I find it quickly? Oh, I know where it was. Jeez, maybe I don't. One more half second while I fumble around over way too many notes. I think we could do both. Trevor, did you have a concern about? No, I, well, I wanted to. My, I made a note it... that MMC 17.40.040 seemed vague uh, from what I was seeing. So, and, but I'm not a planner and I'm, I don't want to play one on TV. So I would appreciate the staff's help on how we can clarify this area of the code better. So this situation, there's much more clarity for everyone else coming down the pike and for the planning commission to be able to rule on it. Yeah, my, my only point was that the, the changing the floor area to TDSF in that section as it's always been used is an easy change. The issue about covered um, areas counting as TDSF, I think is more complicated. So that was, you know, what I was hoping to get direction on. Well, we're not saying change this. We're saying bring it in front of uh, Zeresis and let's have a robust public discussion because we need to, you know, you always got to consider the law of unintended consequences. And, you know, I'm trying to think of it. We're going to have a, uh, you know, a world of inverted uh, wedding cake houses here. <laughs> I don't really think so because the covered area, if it's, a, if it's included in your TDSF, nobody's really going to want to do that. But we should air all that stuff out. And yeah. I, I was just curious if it was more an issue of, you know, the two thirds rule, you know, how the measurement's done or just what's counting as, you know, what the first floor is, you know, that that's really. Well, what it, what's they're kind of intertwined. <laughs> Aren't they? Um, until we know what the first floor is, how do we know if we're uh, violating the two thirds rule? Well, Exactly. I mean, um, maybe now is not the time to try and get too deep into that, but clearly this area is. Maybe we can come back with something a little bit, a little help from staff on this, because we could spend another hour trying to define that. And I don't think we want to do that now. Yeah, I don't think that's our, what our job is right now, other exactly. than exactly look at kind so, of what's been on the books and how it applies to this project. Yes. So let's move forward and I'll, I'll, I'll trust our amazing planning staff to deal with that mess. <laughs> Mike, yeah, I can just um, ask Trevor or Bonnie, and I don't know if there's consensus from council, but maybe we can get something back on this to race this in the next couple months. The reason that all this is questionable is just... Um, I'll defer to Reva about that. If she wants us to take this up, we've got a, a couple other things, um, but I agree this is an area of the code that, that would, um, benefit from getting some clarification. It's something that we could blend together with some of the other things that are we're working on and clean up issues like the beachfront. Add it to the list. Um, yes, we will. work with Bonnie on uh, scheduling that. I, I, without off the top of my head, I don't want to commit to a timing on anything given where we're at right now with resources. But we'll do everything we can to get and it going. I, I know we have a lot of priorities too um, in Zoraces too, so. Um, okay, we have uh, uh, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Just to clarify, that was Stack's recommendation. Was the uh, motion? Yes, that was uh, Mayor Pro Tem's yes. motion. Mayor Pro Tem Peak. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. 
Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? No. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, I'm gonna call for hopefully a five minute break. It's only 1 a.m. in New York. So um, let's uh, five minute break and we'll come back and try and finish up the other 27 item. All right, thank you. So back at uh, 10.03 and uh, council members can turn off their cameras. Okay, who do we got? I don't see Rick yet. I see Susan. Can you hear me okay? Again, perfectly. Perfect. Let's see who else we waiting for. Looks like Rick. Well, oh, there's Sky. He's back. Mayor Pro Tem is back. We're just waiting for Rick, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, wait, and I forgot my water. I'll be right back. I'm back. 
Have everybody. You have everybody now. Okay. All righty. Uh, we are now back in session here at 10.04 p.m. And we're on to item 4B, an ordinance amending section 2.52040 of the Malibu Municipal, Municipal Code, Chapter 2.52, the Emergency Services Organization. Can we have a staff report, please? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I hope you're all doing well tonight. This evening, I'm here with a proposed ordinance to amend the Municipal Code relative to the Emergency Services Organization. So earlier this year, the Governor's Office of Emergency Services updated their uh, requirements for accredited disaster councils. So the City of Malibu's Disaster Council was accredited in 1994. Now, the reason for having an accredited disaster council is so that you can register community volunteers as disaster service workers. And as a disaster and a registered disaster service worker, you are then provided with certain protections by the state as a volunteer. And you are also eligible, eligible for state workers compensation benefits in the event you're injured while on duty. So our Malibu CERT team, everyone on the team, they are all registered disaster service workers. So in order to help maintain their benefits and to also to continue to be able to register community volunteers as disaster service workers, the state's requiring that we do a couple of things. So the first thing that we need to do is update our emergency services organization to state that we will have our disaster council meet at least once per year. And then the other thing is that we will comply with the California Emergency Services Act. The other thing we're asked to update is a resolution that's relevant to the workers' compensation benefits. Our original resolution was adopted in 1991. And the one that's before you tonight is essentially identical to that one. The main difference is the regulatory agency has changed from the California Disaster Council to the Governor's Office of Emergency Services is now the regulatory agency for that. Uh, fortunately, um, complying with these new rules is not going to be a problem for us. We already comply with the California Emergency Services Act. Our Disaster Council already meets at least once per year. Um, and so this will be uh, basically just updating our municipal ordinance to basically reflect what we're already doing. So that is my report. And just let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you very much for that report. Do we um, have any speakers? On this? We do not. We do not. Um, City Council, I turn to you. Can I make Comments, a questions? Sky? Can I make a motion to approve this? Second. We have a motion second. Trevor wants to make a, he also wants to chime in. I just want to um, read the ordinance. So this would be a, the motion would be to approve ordinance number 467, an ordinance of the city of Malibu amending section 2.52040, disaster council powers and duties in chapter 2.52, emergency services organization of title II, administration of personnel, the Malibu municipal code to require the disaster council to comply with the California emergency services act and immediately least once annually and finding the same exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Okay, was there any more comments before you vote, Jefferson? And you're muted, I mean, you're muted. Still muted. Hold the space bar. Did that work? Yep. There you go, there you go. All right, um, just wanted to ask Susan to make sure uh, and have the understanding that when the VOPs are on job, or the our VOPs, they would be covered under this as well? I believe they would be disaster service workers with the sheriff's department, not the city. Okay. Yeah, they're covered under the sheriff's department, not under the city. Just checking for clarification. I didn't know what they fell under. So um, anyway, they deserve it. If, and uh, I'm happy to work with this one. It looks good. And I'm glad you brought it forward. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Yes, thank you for all the hard work, Susan, on this thank you. public safety stuff. 
Any more comments before we vote? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Peak. Yes. Councilmember Mullen. Yes. Councilmember Ferrer. Yes. Councilmember Wagner. Yes. Uh, Mayor Pearson. Yes. Motion carried. Okay, thank you very much. We are on to item 6A, Cliffs Cliffside Drive Proposed Utility Underground Assessment District. Can we have a report, please? Yes, uh, good evening, Council. Um, tonight, we have a request to develop a, a, a utility underground assessment district. Um, last, last April, we received a request from owners on the Cliffside Drive to actually form a, or to place all their overhead utilities underground and form an assessment district. And an assessment district here will be used to kind of finance the cost to um, put all the utilities un underground. And then those assessments will be placed on the property tax. So the property owners could pay off that assessment over a, a number of years, so, so usually around 30 years. Um, staff received uh, or requested about $200,000 from the property owners to get this um, assessment district formed and going. Those funds will be used towards for um, hiring consultants, um, paying the utilities, and the actually fees to come up with the actual cost to, to underground all their utilities and, and um, move the project forward. Um, a couple of things that I, I want to point out. Uh, one where there's a there is a typo that was in the staff report. The underground district would be on Cliffside D Drive, west of um, Fernhill. And in the staff report, there was a, a mis there was a there was a an error in there. One said west or east, but it's it's from it's that cul-de-sac area, and it's about 28 properties that are, will be included in this. So. Uh, last thing that I want to point out that um, um, this project wasn't included in um, the work plan, but however, staff could utilize the $200,000 deposit towards staff time to cover expenses that we have. And, and um, that should be enough to get us going and started to set this assessment. And so um, at this time, we're just asking council direction on whether we should start this process and move forward and form this assessment district. And I'm available for questions. Okay, and before we go to public speakers or anything, I just wanna say, I really like your look tonight. You're kind of a little in, in, the, sh in the shade there and got the glasses. I don't know, you got, a, you, got a, you got a good look going there. Good to see you, Rob. <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's better than the red look I had about three weeks or the about three council meetings ago. So I gotcha, I gotcha. Okay, um, are there any public speakers on this item? We have one public speaker, Mark De Paola. Okay, uh, let's open the public hearing and have Mark speak. Are you there, Mark? Yes, can you hear me? We can. All right. I'll be very brief because it's getting late for everybody. Um, I'm a resident on Cliffside. We bought the parcel about 10 years ago and uh, built a house and moved in about six years ago. We love Malibu and uh, the naturalness. And um, of course, we're all very aware of fire and, uh, and beauty two things that both come to mind in Malibu. Um, on Cliffside Drive, in uh, approximately the last year and a quarter, we've had uh, two transformers catch on fire, uh, one on our block and uh, one on the uh, block closer to Big Doom. We've also had a uh, down power line when a tree hit it. And um, I think it goes without saying that um, we would feel a lot safer with uh, those power lines underground. Certainly it adds to the beauty aspect as well, the aesthetics of uh, removing those power lines. I don't think I need to explain to anyone. It just looks so much more natural and, and rural and kind of in line with why we're all in Malibu. 
I began reaching out to neighbors um, quite a few months ago to see if there was interest in uh, forming a uh, district to underground them. I got a lot of interest and uh, no neighbors responded uh, that they were not in support after uh, multiple uh, flyer drops and mailboxes. So we began uh, raising money and in consultation with, uh, with Rob and Arthur, uh, issued a significant, at least to us, check to the city to begin the process. So we're really excited to kick it off. We know it's gonna take a long time, but we've gotta start somewhere. And uh, we hope this can be a blueprint for other neighborhoods that want to improve their uh, safety and uh, rural aesthetics. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, any other public speakers? No. Okay, I'll close uh, the public hearing and back to the city council here. Do I have any comments or a motion, Rick? Yeah, I wanna say thanks to Mark, one, for staying up so late to attend this council meeting, but also for the incredible cat herding work. It's not easy to organize the neighbors, especially when it comes to parting with money. But I think you're setting a great example, and uh, I hope that um, I'm sure it's going to be a difficult road ahead, no matter how it happens, that, but you'll share your lessons with everybody who uh, follows in your your footsteps and, and decides to do this for their own neighborhoods, because I think it's really a smart thing. It's an investment in your future, and it's an investment of not only the you're right. It's the it's the double edged um, benefit. It's uh, no question about the safety thing, and no question about the aesthetic thing. I mean, it's kind of silly when you look at the power poles. It looks like you know here on the 21st century, and we got this 1800s type technology everywhere. So nice work, a uh, great example for everybody. And so it is only that the cul-de-sac area when like when you come. That's that is I'm. You said it was west, but I think it's east of Fernell, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's. Oh, did I say west? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh. Okay. It, I mean, it is. It, it is late, but yes, um, it, it is east of Fernell. No, it's, it's great. Yeah. I think it's a great thing. I have complete support, and I'm impressed by, uh, you know, the neighborhood stepping up. Um, other council comments or a motion, uh, Jefferson. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, it uh, could also be open now that the, the door may be open, depending on the council vote, that uh, the people west of Fern toward Big Doom may want to join into this as well once they see the pleasing set of those lost poles and the values of their properties go up when those poles are not there. Uh, it's also the servicing and the safety. So you may find that uh, you have a bigger district than you, you feel later on. And I'm happy that you're doing it. And I hope those people up Big Rock and Las Flores can uh, use this as a format for them to get theirs together too and move forward with their undergrounding. Thank you. Uh, Skyler? Is Mark still on the line? He's, I see him. He's still here. So I was going to ask Mark if he approached anyone else on a cliffside, I guess, going further to the west up towards Birdview or anybody else on Fern Hill um, about expanding this district. I very much understand why he did the area that he did, but I was just curious. Yes. Hey, hi, Skylar. Um, I did. I, I uh, approached uh, a few what I thought were influential neighbors uh, on the other block of Cliffside to ask uh, if they would uh, be interested in kind of being the liaison for their block because it's a ton of work and it really needs kind of a block by block, um, uh, you know, head person. And none of none of them were interested because I, I, we would save money by doing it with a, a larger group, but I can't, you know, I think someone said shepherding cats. If if they're not interested, I don't want to push them to do it. Um, so I was a little bit disappointed, but I did reach out to them and uh, didn't didn't get interest on the other block at Cliffside. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I don't know if there's been a motion that's made, but I would be make a motion to uh, move forward with this. And thank you, Mark, for all your hard work on it. I know it's not easy. I'll second that. Okay, and Mark, yeah, thank you. I 
I think it's great. I, yeah, I, I think obviously getting a lot of support from the council here. Uh, thanks for your energy. Thanks for your efforts on this. And we have a motion in a second. If there any more comments before we uh, take roll call? Do you need further direction, Reva? No, we don't. We're fine with that um, as long as the council is in favor of us moving forward with this. And we anticipate the staff cost to be uh, somewhere in the range of $25,000 or less. Um, so we will charge that against the deposit um, that the um, neighborhood has provided us um, in the unfortunate event that um, the other costs for the consultants exceed um, the staff costs and what needs to be done. We'll let the neighbors know uh, way ahead of time as well as the council, but uh, we think we'll be able to make it work within uh, the amount that they have graciously provided. Okay. Um, okay. Do you need to read it again, Trevor? Or are we okay? I uh, think uh, we, you, you uh, the motion was to accept the deposit and then to provide direction to move forward as uh, explained by the city manager. Does that reflect your motion in the second? Yes, it does. So, uh, can I have a roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Ferrer? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. We're on to 6B, Doom Drive and Fernhill Drive speed humps. Um, can we have a report on this, please? Uh, yes, you have me again. So good evening again. Uh, so tonight we're, we're going to be discussing adding speed humps on Point Doom. Uh, um, last January, uh, the Public Safety Commission um, asked me to provide a presentation to them regarding uh, um, speed humps on Point Doom. Um, after the presentation that I gave, uh, the Public Safety Commission made a recommendation to add speed humps on Doom Drive and on Fern Hill between Gray Fox and Cliffside. And, and the reason is that they uh, provided for those, those speed humps was safety for that neighborhood. They felt um, these speed humps would help with safety, especially around the school. Um, so once again, this project isn't on the adopted work plan. Um, however, um, I, I do have sufficient funding in our annual street maintenance project to take care of speed humps in, in that area. And I have a contractor that's actually working where I can have them do it pretty quickly um, probably within the next um, few weeks if if council moves forward. So um, at this point, we're just asking council to give us direction whether to add these speed humps at those location and um, and we'll move forward. And I'm, I'm available for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Um, do we have any public speakers on this item? We do. We have two, sp two public speakers, John Mazza and Jane Albrecht. Okay, let's, let's, have the, let's open the public hearing and let's go. This is John. Did you want to talk to me first? Go yeah, ahead, John. you first. Okay, uh, the genesis of this came when the schools merged. And we gave uh, the planning commission gave them a CUP to operate the two schools and became apparent that there that with the projected amount of students uh, coming in that there'd be a big influx of traffic because all the traffic before was local and it's now coming from most all of Western Malibu. So uh, we put a condition on their CUP that they mediate the traffic problem. Uh, they cannot do anything on city streets, so I went to the to the uh, safety commission, and they looked at the. Um, they had four meetings on this actually, and they looked at the speed signs that are on point doing that tell you how fast you're going. That that has a record of the speeds, and found that, especially on Doom Drive, but also on Fern Hill, there were instances of people going over seventy miles an hour, and. Uh, the reason why we're not, they recommended not to put speed humps on Gray Fox is Rob informed them that 
uh, you can't put a speed bump on a hill that, that steep. So that's why it's not contiguous. Um, the, the problem continues, and I think you've gotten letters from the school district wanting these. Uh, it's pretty important because uh, on Fern Hill, they, they double lane it there, uh, and there's times at which people race by the uh, by the lineup going into the school, and you could very easily hit a kid uh, or traffic guy or whatever. So uh, I hope you approve this. I hope Rob takes a look at the speed humps on some of the other streets like Zumarez. They were put in a little too low, and, and once people get used to them, they can take them at a 50 miles an hour. Um, these are not meant to jar your car, just to make you aware that you shouldn't be speeding. It's, no, they're not speed bumps, but they need to be yeah, maybe an inch higher or something. Um, so I hope you approve it. Uh, the school district very much is in favor of it, and it will solve a lot of problems. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jane Albrecht. Hello, can people hear me? Yeah, we can. Great. Um, it was interesting for me to, first of all, it's nice to see everyone, if albeit virtually you all look like you're surviving the pandemic pretty well, at least healthily. Um, it was interesting for me to hear for the first time tonight from Rob Debu and John Mazza how this came about. For those of you, some of you will know some of the history of this, for those of you who don't. Uh, Doom Drive and Fern Hill Drive are two main thoroughfares for the fire department on Point Doom critically important for rapid response time in both case of fires and medical emergencies where minutes, even seconds count, can mean the difference between life and death, a small fire and a huge conflagration. Interestingly, in the conversation so far, I've heard nothing about anyone talking to the residents of Point Doom. And yet this matter was extensively taken up only a couple of years ago. And at that time, the city sent notices to all Point Doom residents that speed bumps were being considered. The city, um, paid for a traffic study to be done, which found, in fact, a comprehensive traffic study, that there was a very high level com of compliance with the traffic laws on the point, um, certainly on Fernhill Drive. I think historically there's been a little more problem with Doom Drive. The fire department was opposed to the speed bumps precisely because of the problems it creates for response time. And that was before the Woolsey fire, when most of us were concerned about house fires, electrical fires on our electrical transformers, and, and medical emergencies. As at that time, we all thought Point Doom will never burn. We learned differently. Um, uh, at, that, at the meetings, they held two meetings with residents. They sent notices out, which they should do in this case before they do anything, to let all residents know that this is being considered. Re they were well attended. Residents came, some, of, some uh, were in favor, some were opposed, but by far the majority were opposed. At that time, and this is only a couple years ago, we're talking two, three years ago, the decision that the city made was sensible. A few streets, mostly which were dead-end streets, um, uh, where the residents predominantly wanted them, speed bumps were put in. There's a lot of speed bumps on Point Doom these days. There's not on Fernhill and Doom. Um, some speed signs were added to let people know how fast we're going, and, and when you enter Point Doom to say children live here, drive slowly. There's already several stop signs on Fernhill Drive, one of which was put in years ago to slow people down. Um, and the stretch between Fernhill and Grasswood is only about a third of a mile long. Um, I would like to know, it's interesting that this has happened. You know, we've had our school enlarged. We've welcomed it as residents. Not a big problem. But nobody told the residents, well, this is going to mean you're going to have more speed bumps. And I, it's nice to know that they're thinking about the school district, but not the residents. I really think if you go forward, you've got to do what you did before. And, and that is notify all the residents. I think you should do a proper speed study yeah, and yeah. then hear from the residents. That's your time. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Um, do we have any other speakers, Heather? No, that's it. Okay, um, we're back to the council. Do we have um, comments from councilors? Uh, Rick? Uh, you know, I want to hear from the residents of Point Doom or on the council, but uh, Jane does make some compelling 
um, arguments about drive and Fern Hill and first responders. That's actually a good point. Um, so I'm, I really kind of want to hear from the people who live there and drive there and what they think about, I mean, cause doom having speed bumps, hmm. you know, I could see it on the little streets around the school or, you know, what they, what they do Boniface or Selfridge, those things worked out pretty well there, but the, those two are kind of big thoroughfares. So I'm interested in what the residents on the council had to say. Um, Karen. Thank you. Um, thanks to both of the public speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick, for asking what uh, we Point Doom Council members think. Um, we do have speed humps on my street. My street's not a thoroughfare uh, like Doom Drive or Fern Hill. Um, they've helped on my street. I can't say that no one speeds, but they have helped. Um, the fact that Doom Drive is such a thoroughfare, I think, is exactly why it needs speed humps. I'm always amazed at the driving that I see, uh, at the speeds, at people going around other people. I hate to say not neighborly driving, and I'm not saying that only neighbors are driving there. There are workmen and, and other things, but... It's, it's really not good. Um, I understand the concern about emergency response time. I will respectfully say I don't think speed humps would have made the difference on homes being saved in the Woolsey fire. It was a much bigger issue than that. Um, I'm going to pose a question to Rob or anybody who has uh, experience in this. What about the issue of speed tables as opposed as opposed to speed humps? Um, so, so speed tables, it's it's the same height as a speed hump. It's just the top of it is a, a longer stretch, and so it, it's the same height. It's just just I, I don't know the top of my head how wide they are or and what the width is, but it's just a just a longer stretch of that height. But it's the same height. And the effect on traffic or speed? Um, that I, I don't know. The top of my head, I, I would expect that it would probably be uh, it would probably help a little bit more. But uh, but my experience has just been with speed humps. And you know, working those and those do help. Uh, um, so, okay, thanks. You know, I would say if if people drove sensibly, obeyed the speed limit, drove neighborly, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But that's not what's happening. Um, and if we could have more enforcement, we might be able to change behavior. But uh, it comes and goes as we all know, and uh, we get a few tickets being written and people calm down for a while and then they go back to their old habits. Uh, I did, as I think everyone on the council did, receive letters from um, both uh, board member Craig Foster and from the Malibu Pathway Director, Isaac Burgess, both strongly in favor of this. Um, I have not received any correspondence uh, not in favor of it. So um, I'll leave it at that. I, I would like to hear what other council members have to say, particularly Skyler, since he's also a point doom neighbor. Mayor Pro Tem Skyler, would you like to address this? Yeah, I was just looking up some data on speed tables, which it looks like they can actually be used um, and cars can be traveling faster over them than the speed humps. Uh, which was kind of surprising, but that's what it looks like with a little Google search. Um, so I, with some neighbors, uh, I think it was in like 2012, um, some people submitted some petitions to me for various streets, uh, put speed humps on point doom at the time, uh, Jim Thorson was a city manager. 
And so there was a lot of signatures and stuff that were gathered back then. There were signatures for Fernhill and Doom Drive at the time. And the decision was made not to put them there because there was a couple of very loud vocal voices that were very much opposed to having speed bumps. I uh, haven't really heard those come out this time. Maybe it's because there's more kids at the school now. Maybe it's because there's a ton of construction going on on Doom Drive and cars or trucks are going super fast. Um, I can say from personal experience, um, prior to the fire and after the fire, um, as many of you know, I work in construction and we've had a couple jobs on Doom Drive. Um, and I was there uh, for all of the day today and it was remarkably scary to me when I was out at my truck having lunch, how fast people drive on Doom Drive. And I know sometimes if you're standing on the side of the road, you know, just a car passing you at 30 miles an hour is pretty fast. But there was definitely cars that were going 30 miles an hour. And there was definitely cars that were doing every bit of 40 miles an hour plus. So I think um, in talking with people around the neighborhood that I know that there was a lot of people that were frustrated before, um, you know, about what, seven, eight years ago when it didn't happen on those streets and that they would like to see them again. So I know that there will be some people that will be opposed to them. I also remember um, we had a couple meetings with a bunch of the residents of Point Doom at the time. And I remember uh, the fire chief for the area came and spoke. Um, and the question was asked of him, and Rick, you may be able to attest to this a little bit, um, was that whether or not it was gonna slow down his response time to a call. And I think an engineer was there as well and said, it's probably not going to slow down the response time necessarily because you're not going to be driving at a speed in a fire truck in a residential neighborhood like the ones that were mentioned much faster than the 30 or 40 miles an hour that you can go over those speed humps. Yeah, so that's would, that's that, would that be accurate? You're supposed to go the speed limit wherever you are, even yeah. if you're on. So, so that was the, the, the point that I think is kind of a misconception with people with emergency vehicles, um, in particular fire trucks, is that they're not, it's not their job and that they're not supposed to be going faster than the speed limit when they're going down that road. I think that's a misconception for a lot of people. And I just that's want to be that's true. clear that um, in my lifetime of living on Point Doom and seeing, I mean, the fire trucks have been actually going uh, through the neighborhood, I think, a little bit more frequently uh, in the summertime. And I can sit on my deck and watch them go by, and it doesn't look like they're speeding at all. So uh, I don't think that that would negatively impact uh, the response time. So in, in a safe manner. Now, if you had somebody who's driving and they weren't driving safely, then it may be able to take them faster. So I would be, uh, you know, as someone that spent my life on Point Doom, I think it's, they could always be removed if we decided that it wasn't making the road, people drive slower or if it wasn't, you know, being safer. I remember um, that was a comment that, that Jim had made at that time, you know, if we put them in and nobody wants them, then they can be removed. But it seems like, in areas where they get put in that the neighborhood seems to kind of appreciate them because when you are taking a walk or when you're with your dog or child or, you know, spouse or loved one and you're walking, I mean, you notice that people kind of slow down near them. So if anything, we should maybe be restriping them a little bit more so people see them so that they do slow down. Anyway, that's what I have to add. Thank you, uh, Skylar. Uh, Jefferson. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, once again, it comes down to how high you make it and how wide you make it. The standard between four and six feet, the elevation of eight to 10 inches. Those are things that Rob could determine. A typical class A fire truck has a couple hundred gallons of water in it. Um, they're designed to do that. Rick will probably tell you that in a few minutes that, hey, if you're going the speed limit and you hit a speed hump, you're still good. You're not going to jar anybody. You're the water, the, the water inside the vessels that they're contained in have baffles. So there's no load movement when you go over a speed hump in a class A truck. But once again, it's how you stripe it. And um, 
what kind of asphalt and how deep you compress it, like Skylar said, stripe it well, you'll get people to slow down. I think Rick might want to comment on the class A and the speed, you know, technical things. Only I only had the, I went to class on that up at Camarillo and at the airport there and they had the, the speed humps at six feet and eight inches of elevation and the, we drove them over it and it was fine. That's yeah. speed. Humps are fine. They're not a problem. And you know what? We have these in my neighborhood in Ramirez Canyon and, and everybody likes them and they're very popular and they're very effective too. And they're humps, not bumps, you know, so you have to slow down, but they're not onerous and, uh, but they're effective. And we do stripe them with big yellow stripes. So everyone kind of sees them coming. And even on Zumirez, which is above where I live, um, people race around there, you know, and it's like they, they cut off from Canaan to PCH and one, that's a privately maintained road. So they put some humps in up there and, and that that's effective. So I, I think it, I think it is good. I wouldn't worry at all about the emergency response thing. They'll be fine. Just, just make sure they're not the bumps, you know, because those are horrible, but the humps are fine. Well, Skylar. I had another question for Rob, which was, are you also, um, and I, I don't think it's mentioned here, but is there a plan to lower the speed limit on Doom Drive, or is that going to stay, I think, at 30 miles an hour? Uh, um, it's It has to stay at 30. That's That was the speed survey that we did. Uh, I, I, I remember that. I was just curious. But but with the speed humps uh, um, that, that are being proposed in there, when we do a, a, a new speed start survey, it, it may lower it. So... It could be a good thing for upcoming speed survey and actually lowering that speed limit in there. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have any like legal issues with having uh, speed humps on a street where the speed limit is 30 miles an hour. Oh yeah, there isn't any issues with that. It's it's um, it, it's fine. We just have to place them in the right spot, make sure they're not um, um, going to be an unsafe condition if we put them in there. Great, Mike Jefferson. Last, last uh, moment and last comment. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, also on social media and uh, on the uh, ways and the apps that you use, uh, those will show up, and that should help with a few percentage of the cut down of people racing through to save time when PCH is clogged up. So uh, that's another bonus, I think, for the homeowners in that area. Once those humps are in there and everybody knows about it, it it's one more thing people think about when they're going to go through your neighborhood or look at it as a shortcut. Thank you. Okay, Skylar. I was also going to add that I just, you know, for anyone that's listening to this, that, you know, if you're on a street that's not included on this and it's not a street that's, you know, very hilly, you know, on point to, you know, Cliffside, Birdview, Blue Water, the other ones that come to mind, you know, if there's a consensus, I think, among the neighbors or people that live there that they would want them on their street, I'm sure that the council would be, you know, open to that to that idea as well. I, just, I know that I've heard complaints of people um, speeding a lot on uh, Birdview and certain portions of Cliffside, so just putting that out there. Okay, uh, well, I, I defer to city council that lives there. I know in my neighborhood we have various styles of humps and bumps from different eras and if you have a really good car you still they still do about 50 either way but you hear them then everyone yells at them so um yeah i agree that they they do help slow the most cars down uh so um do can is there more conversation or can we get a motion on this i'll make a motion to uh receive the recommendation and implement some more speed humps on point two uh, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any more comments? Okay. Can I have roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you very much. We are now on item 6C. Procedures required for election of a directly elected mayor or strong mayor. Can we have a report, please? Sure. 
Um, good evening. I don't have much to add to the report, but I wanted to point out a few things. In California, there are two kinds of cities, charter and general law, and we are a general law city. That means we have two options. We can function as we do with five equal council members and a rotating mayor, or we can move to having a directly elected mayor where the mayor usually appoints all the commissions and boards, but we could also define the mayor's duties differently if we went down that path. If we went this route, we would need to put a measure on the ballot to, to uh, move that way. Um, we've also been asked to look into the strong mayor option and a strong mayor is someone who generally would have a separate office and hiring and firing ability over the city manager and potentially some other department heads um, that could have other powers as well related to the budget or other things. Um, but we, in order to do that, we would need to have a charter. And at this point, we don't have enough time to put a charter on the ballot for this year, but it is something that could be looked at down the road. I'm available if there are any questions um, or any, uh, anything else you want to discuss. Okay, thank you very much, Trevor. Um, do we have public speakers? We have po uh, four public speakers, Joe Drummond, Lance Simmons, Vicki D, and Craig Hill. Okay. So first we'll hear from Joe Drummond. Okay, thank you. Hi again. Um, I, I do believe it's not going to be on the November ballot, but I did hope that a strong mayor option would be added to the November ballot. Malibu needs the expertise and experience of a long-termer who can be the face and voice of the city. To have things go through their office, not just the city manager, is crucial for the proper management of the city. A strong mayor will represent the voice of all Malibu residents, not just a few. Should we break down into districts, this will be even more significant. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next, we hear from Lance Simmons. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, I last spoke on this issue way back when we could all be in the same room together. Uh, and I want to reiterate forcefully what I said then. I implored you at that point to reject the extortionist demands of a couple of lawyers, and I used that term judiciously, who were threatening to sue the city unless it bowed to their desires to scrap our at-large voting system in favor of districts arguing that we were somehow circumventing the rights of minority populations from participating in a free and fair election scheme. As a person who has spent over four decades in dedicated public service advancing the rights of our most vulnerable citizens, I would be the first in line to charge the ramparts if I thought that was a real issue of concern in our community here. It is not. A recent ruling in a case in Santa Monica should put to rest concerns among our leadership here that we might be hit with a large financial liability unless we cave to these demands. As it is, these charlatans have already pocketed $30,000 at the taxpayer's expense. Shame on you, and since public flogging is not an acceptable remedy in the 21st century, a public scolding will have to do, and I'm referring to the lawyers here. At a time when we are struggling with the after effects of the Woolsey fire, another encroaching fire season, unusually warm temperatures and dry weather conditions, a pandemic that threatens both our economy and the public health of our citizens, and the need to plan for the upcoming school year. I can only say to those who exercise Trumpian style litigation threats, you do a large disservice to your community. During my career, I served as assistant executive director of the U.S. Conference of Mayors for six years, representing mayors of cities that ranged from 30,000 in population to 10 million. I have served side by side with very distinguished mayors, and I have the utmost respect for our city's chief executives. However, there are far-reaching logistical issues involved in changing the form of local government from city council manager to strong mayor. Also, there will be substantial financial considerations. At this particular time, I am not sure we have enough information as a community to adequately assess these issues on the November ballot. Plus, we will have two or maybe three new city council persons elected in November. I believe it is best left 
to the new elected leadership to tackle this issue after the November election. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Vicki D. Well, she doesn't appear to be in the meeting. So we'll move on to Craig Hill. Hi, good. Uh, thanks for your praises, Trevor. That was really good. Everyone else, there's at least three different concepts to keep sorted out. Charter city, strong mayor, elected mayor. They have different considerations. Many folks have strong opinions on all this, and I believe that people should get to choose. And yeah, the pathway by which council drafts a charter, it's too late. But there is another pathway. The council can initiate the commission process, and you could start that in parallel with the financial analysis because you wouldn't have to spend real money till you commit to putting it on the ballot. So it would be a negligible cost to start asking for submissions of nominees for the commission. A few public notices in the paper, some emails and online. Then if you decide that the rest of the process is affordable, you're ready to pull the trigger. The ballot language itself is given on page five of the staff report and is simply, quote, shall a charter commission be elected to propose a new charter, end quote. It's really simple. Hey, you, shush, shush over there. Um, Switching to a charter city doesn't necessarily mean strong there. It could, but plenty of hybrid city structures exist to use as models. The main point of having a charter city is to be able to customize our governmental structure to fit our unique needs. Two quick examples. For the charter city, we could provide a basic subsistence salary for council, so it could attract candidates who could afford to treat it as their profession. And we could devise some mechanism for requiring that certain city positions or a percentage of positions would be held by residents so that we'd be more directly governing ourselves. Let's get the commission nomination process rolling. If the financial analysis reveals some unforeseen red flag, you could pause it before spending real money. Meanwhile, let's let the people decide the elective mayor option too, if we're gonna remain a general law city, it could be beneficial even if we don't go to districts. And we're not now, I guess, but some folks might like to have a dedicated mayor for reasons of continuity and dealing with the city manager's office and with outside agencies. As a new office, it's open to folks who've been termed out, and I've sussed it out. There's no one objectionable who could win. Um, some may like that if the statutory term of two years is chosen, then that's in effect one council member who can be voted out sooner. There are other good reasons and really no reasons not to let the people decide. It will cost almost no staff time because the ballot language, again, it's already specified in the code. Incidentally, the staff report may be incorrect in stating that maps of four districts would need to be drawn because yes, maybe eventually, but the maps wouldn't need to be drawn ever if the districting effort doesn't happen. And that sounds like it's not, so we don't need the maps. And um, even if we did have to go to districts for some reason, the four plus one map wouldn't be needed until prior to the subsequent election when the mayoral candidates would be running for the first time. So the mapping aspect is not a cost. Uh, so in short, put both the commission process and the elective mayor options on the ballot. Neither of them take much time at all. It'll be really simple and let the people decide. And we can, we can sort it, that out um, on the other side of the ballot box. Thanks. And that concludes public comment. Okay, we're back to the council. Council comments? Who's all excited to talk about it? Rick. You know, um, I always say these things should be needs driven. You know, a lot of the actions we take should be because there's a need out there. Or, you know, if we're going to change our form of government or modify it, it should be because something's not working and it's really screwed up and and I don't see a compelling case for that. Even when it comes to the, the districting thing, which in my opinion, um, well, I'm, we're not even talking about that, but uh, this is a bit of the tail wagging the dog. You know, it's the, the districting thing came about um, from somebody else, not, you know, I mean, as it was a resident technically, I guess, but uh it was not something that there was a groundswell for. And then this thing got attached to it. I think both of these things fall into the category of 
uh, probably now is not the appropriate time to be contemplating either of these issues. And I, I actually think that Lance summed it up pretty well. Um, if we're going to do it, let's do it later, not in the middle of our second major frickin' um, disaster and emergency that's constrained the budget, reduced the resources, et cetera. That was the problem with the whole redistricting thing. It's like, seriously, you have to deal with this now on top of everything else we have to do. For me, there's not a real compelling issue to uh, even look at this right now. Um based on uh, the austerity of the, our budget and the priorities of that we've already designated in terms of aftermath of the Woolsey fire, getting everyone rebuilt and public safety efforts and things like the school separation, which, you know, there is a lot, there's major support for those three things. It's a handful of people have talked about this strong mayor thing or the elected mayor thing and, the, redist the redistricting thing. I mean, there's just a handful of people that are interested in that. So even if it was something that there was a lot of uh, support for, it would be something that we should do during quote unquote normal times, you know, when we're not uh, dealing with a global pandemic and the aftermath of a big devastating fire where we have to kind of say no to a lot of things. So that's, that's my commentary on that. I think that if we're going to contemplate something like this, I mean, I would be all for it if it was like, you know, our form of government is totally screwed up because it's ruining the way things are going and it's completely uh, corrosive to our mission statement or whatever. And that's not the case. I don't really see it. So if we're ever going to contemplate this, it should be put off to some other time in the future, if ever. That's my lead in comments. Thank you, Rick. Um, Karen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I started researching this a long time ago, shortly after I was elected, uh, just out of my own interest. And, uh, you know, you can go online and find information from a variety of sources. Um, I think the first place I found it was um, the international, what's it called, city, county government association or something like that. City County Management Association. That's what it is. Thank you. Um, and like I said, I did this on my own, just for my own edification. And this report uh, replicates a lot of what I learned going back probably a year and a half ago. Um, and I will say that... Uh, one thing that really struck me was that uh, in our state, I believe we have 482 cities. Um, and, you know, I've been to several conferences that the league has put on and, and also uh, JPIA. Of the 482 cities in California, incorporated cities, 477 of them use the council manager form of government. So that right there told me something. It must be working or we wouldn't have almost every single city in the state using it. Um, the cities that do not use it are, I think they are the five largest cities. Um, and if they're not, they're close to that because the five cities that don't use it uh, comprise over 7 million residents. So our city of 13,000, uh, and I think at last count, somewhere around 8,000 registered voters, I just don't think we have the pool of candidates here to do this kind of a job. Um, and, and along with what Lance said, and Lance, I want to thank you for your common sense um, reaction to this. This is, in my opinion, even looking at this or making it a ballot measure, a further drain on already hugely impacted resources. Um, we're 
we we did make a decision, which I still think was the right one to waive permit fees, but that was a giant trade off. Uh, and it is costing more than anyone anticipated. But we're staying that course because we believe in it as a council. Um, now we've got a pandemic. Uh, luckily for us, our our revenue is not heavily dependent on uh, retail tax or uh, sales tax or TOT, or we'd be in much worse shape. But this, this is a road that I don't think we can afford to go down for many reasons, um, and particularly not right now. So um, I would like to thank the staff for uh, putting this report together. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Um, and that, those are my comments. Thank you, Karen. Um, Skyler or Jefferson, either one. I was just going to make a motion to scrap this idea right now. Is that, okay, well, let's go to, let's, uh, there's a motion. Okay, let me go to Jefferson next. But I'll second that in the meantime. The scrappy thing. Okay. Jefferson. Well, thank you for the diplomacy and uh, the honor to speak because I am one fifth of this count as far as I see it. I wanted to thank Trevor for doing his homework on this and presenting what looks like a fair and balanced assessment. I also spoke to the uh, Malibu Board of Realtors the other day and gave the same appraisal about Trevor's work in presenting this to the Board of Realtors. Um, just for clarification, um, I'm referring back to Karen's comments uh, that very few cities do this. Um, right on the bottom of page one of six, it has the numbers. 482 cities in California, 125 are charter cities. So I guess about one third are charter cities. The reason this came up is because a number of people, not a handful, a number of people have mentioned this to a number of us, whether you recognize it or not. So the idea was is to look forward to this in the future. And now without the redistricting being a priority, because I think it's a low priority now, or it's just something that'll be on the back burner. The strong mayor option does not look like a fair option to present to our city. An elected mayor, on the other hand, pretty much leaves things intact, as is Trevor is illustrated here with his craftsmanship, that pretty much everything is intact. And with a charter city, the council still makes the rules about what the mayor does and how he behaves and who he hires. And it seemed like an option that we may explore in the future. So if you set up a commission or drafted for a commission, you'd allow the people to actually have structure in the future the way they see it. Um, I don't agree with Rick that uh, there's just a few people because the reason this is here, as I mentioned earlier, is there are a lot of people frustrated with the, the timing of a number of events. You may get different people from different avenues, whether it's the dark sky people, the rodenticide people, the short-term rental people. All these people have their frustrations that they vented because the city takes so long to behave in their favor. And these are the people that put us here. So an option you could say before you slam this thing down is, hey, Maybe we could put this out there. It's not expensive where we draft a commission that appoints a commission or appoints to how to put it onto the ballot. But to overlook this and simply cast it aside, I think you're going to make a number of people aggravated that they didn't even get the chance to vote on a charter city. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jefferson. So I'm I'm glad this item came forward. It's uh it's it's worthy of having a talk. And um, for myself, I definitely have struggled on considering the charter aspect right now. And and Rick gave it some some definition. It's just I mean, how much more can we do right now with what we're everything we're going through? So I don't see 
I don't see, I don't see going down the path of a charter being initiated certainly by me or by us. That to me would have to come from a, a concerted effort of, of the citizens of the city to do a proper petition in my mind, because it's a major deal. Um, as far as an elected mayor, I, I don't have a strong of feelings except that I would agree the timing is odd. And I do worry that it says generally elected mayor appoints all boards, commissions, and committees. I don't think that's the diversity that our city is used to and, and our governance. So that, that doesn't resonate with me right away. And I know that wouldn't be decided, but that's a problem. So for me, I, there's something else I noticed too. Um, Jefferson said he's had a lot of people approach him. And to my surprise, I have not. Um, I thought this would be a much bigger subject of discussion, but here we are with what's supposedly a big issue. We had four speakers, one of which didn't stay and talk. I had five people contact me um, outside of the, then there's just, I believe, a couple of letters. So I don't know where all these people are personally. Um, so I'm wondering if now is the time. I mean, we had a lot of discussion about where we're at right now as a city, and there's a lot of panic, a lot of unknowns. We have really big issues we're struggling to take care of. I don't know that changing our form of government right now makes sense. How are we going to focus on that? Let me ask you another question. How are we going to do the robust public meetings we need to do to do this correctly? We don't have the ability. We're going ahead doing short-term rentals on Zoom. We know it's going to be hard. It's not optimal. So I know there's some people that make good arguments on why we maybe should consider this, and I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. I don't know that we're there. Where is... Where are the people wanting to discuss this? Where are all the letters? We, there's no letters in the file. There's a couple. Uh, we had a couple speakers. So, uh, which surprises me. I thought, I thought this was a bigger issue. Um, so I don't, I personally don't see that it is. I make myself very available to our, our citizens. I, my cell phone numbers out there always. People call me when they need to. Nobody called. So I don't know if now would be the time to go forward with this. As far as coming from me voting for it, I would want to see this come forward on a petition where we had robust public meetings because it's that kind of decision. It should, it should have robust public meetings if people are interested. Citizens should bring this forward. And I know there's a few voices that are well-spoken, that are passionate, but I'm not seeing the, the you know, the clear you know, the room filling with 250 people and even on Zoom, even 50 people or 20 people or 10 people with three people talking this tonight. So um, I know there's a motion I'm ready to vote on it, but I'm open to more uh, comment if people want to make comment. Um, and uh, we'll go back to Rick first. Yeah, we have a hard enough time getting people to run for city council as it is and that's just a part-time thing and uh it's it's not easy to get people to step up i mean they're not exactly blown all over themselves to run for city council and that's a part-time job and i think that karen is uh correct in saying that we got a pretty small pool to draw from and you're talking about having a strong mayor be and what is that a full-time position uh I don't know. I I actually I personally like the um, part time representative who's it's not their primary source of income is a representative of the people. You know, you leave the plow, you come and represent the voices of the people who live in the city, and then you go back to it and you man your plow. And I I like that. I don't. Uh, people have said, oh, you know, you guys need to pay, get paid a lot more money. You do a lot more stuff. Uh, I'm out on that. You know, I think that's that's not the way to go. Um, and then I want to point out a couple things that, that Jefferson said. He said that 125 cities are charter cities. Yeah, but not all. You know, 
charter cities are, can also be council and city manager cities. You have to be a charter city if you want to do the strong mayor, but many of those charter cities are actually council member and city manager uh, forms of government. And the other thing is uh, during this whole school separation thing, uh, the charter city idea was floated as a way to, you know, help us with that issue. And we had long discussions about it. And it, to me, it never made any sense. This doesn't, it, I don't get it. It's not really, I don't, I never saw that doing that would help us with that particular issue. And uh, so it's not like we haven't looked at these things. I think if you're going to do, you know, open heart surgery on the, on the mechanics of the machinery of how the city works, then uh, Mikey makes a great point in that probably not something you want to be doing over Zoom. You know, it uh, should be a robust political discussion with a lot of people involved. And it should be, you know, it's probably something that should be initiated via a petition. You know, to be honest with you, it's like the, uh, it's like the pot store thing. You know, we voted that down and those guys got a petition. And they got it passed. And so that was a groundswell. And they didn't even advertise. Those guys were all over. So, I mean, there's a lot more interested in a pot store in town uh, than there is to have a strong mayor. So I think if the strong mayor people want to want, really feel compelled to do that, then uh, they need to build more of a groundswell. But at this point in time, you know, we're like, man, your battle stations. We're taking out water and everybody grab a bucket and start bailing in terms of dealing with the emergencies and the global pandemic and stuff. And it's probably not the time to be entertaining doing things like this. That's my opinion. I mean, so it definitely should be deferred if ever considered. Okay, uh, Karen? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll make it quick. Um, I just wanted to point out if I wasn't clear in my comments, um, I, I was talking about uh, electing a strong mayor and that is only done by five cities in California. So um, I apologize if my comments weren't um, as uh, clear as they should have been, uh, but that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jefferson. Yes, thank you, Mikey. Uh, once again, um, I had put forward the elected mayor with the, the council so that it's all equal vote. And Trevor did a great job of pointing all this out. Um, I guess it's been overlooked, uh, but there are hybrid examples. Um, you can create the commission anytime you choose. Um, if you put it off, uh, that's fine because it looks like I'm the only one supporting any of this thought. So uh, rather than dragging on the evening any longer, uh, I'll just leave it with uh, my proposal was to allow for a, a committee to be formed to make the assessment for Charter City and for an elected mayor, not a strong mayor. I think we're not ready for a strong mayor, but uh, I think the community might enjoy the fact that you have an elected mayor in a couple years in two years, if you didn't like he or she, you, you get rid of the bum. So that's all uh, my part of this proposal was. And there are 125 cities that do work that way. The, the big cities that Karen had mentioned, the five to seven big cities, uh, that's the format that they use, but they have seven or eight million people that they represent. So it's a whole different, a whole different animal. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jefferson. And uh, while I uh, agree with you to a degree, I, I, I have to side with, I don't know that this is the time to form that committee. So that's where I end up. And uh, let's uh, have a roll call, please. Record, this is- And a motion just to receive and file. Yeah. Oh yes, thank you, absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, Mayor Pro Tempeak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor, um, Councilmember Wagner? No, that's a no to uh, file. Mm -hmm. And Mayor Pearson? Uh, yes, receive and file. 
Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, we're moved into the sevens here. At 11 o'clock, we're into the sevens. We're at 7A, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department use of force. This is, uh, I don't know whose item this was. Um, Mayor, um, the council uh, by consensus asked us to bring this item back. So it's actually not an individual council member's item. Um, and we're seeking um, just some direction on uh, what, how we'd like us to draft a letter, if, if you still want to do that. Okay. Thank you, Reva. Um, do, oh, do we have any public speakers on this item? We have one, uh, Clinton Brown, but I don't think he's in the meeting anymore. Yes, hopefully he's sound asleep. I mean, not hopefully, I just... Um, but yeah. I'd be surprised if he is. How's that? Uh, okay, so uh, no other public speakers? No. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, city Council comments? Skylar. Um, I think we should just draft a rather simple letter that states that we very much encourage the Sheriff's Department to do proper use of force training for its officers and that we would never want to see an incident like what has recently been witnessed um, in the mainstream uh, go on in this area. Okay. Are you referencing the recent issue with the LASD or in general nationwide? I'm thinking the issue, the incident that I'm referencing is the incident that did not happen in LA County uh, with George Floyd. But I just, you know, I think that there is many instances during the protests where there, the sheriffs showed very um, immense amount of restraint in their use of force and were very professional. And I think that there were probably some isolated incidents where that got out of control. And I think that we should just say that, you know, we really want you, you know, to make a commitment to this community that that's one of the priorities. Um, you know, we want officers to be protective and they would do what they have to do to protect themselves by all means. But, you know, I think that there, when we've seen, uh, it seems like a lot of officers with experience are very good at de-escalating situations. That's something that we should be very supportive of. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think Rick, you had your hand up next. Uh, actually, I would like to hear from Jefferson first since he was a reserve deputy. Okay, great. Jefferson, do you want to go next? Uh, thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Rick. Um, yes, uh, I spent time in a green uniform. Uh, sworn, did my 400 hours, uh, so I got post-certification, which is in about 37 states now. It's identified as had that uh, if you're a sheriff or a police officer in one state, you can go to another state and get hired. So these, these post officer, peace officer standard of training uh, do talk about escalation. You have spousal abuse issues. You have specialists in each department that deal with certain situations. For instance, in our homeless situations, we have our um, teams that, that go out and deal with the homeless. And those teams are trained and specialized. So the department responds. It takes a while for a department to respond. To respond. Uh, Villanueva has probably between nine and 10,000 sworn deputies. Um, it's the largest sheriff's department in the United States, I believe. Um, oftentimes we see the one bad deputy or one bad officer out of a hundred. And I think that would be fair to say it's one out of a hundred, but they may spoil it for the other 99. So whatever letter you intend to draft or we intend to draft as a council, I should say, should, you know, recognize that we know that most deputies are doing the best job they can and that specialized deputies may be called in for special circumstances. And like I said, we have people that deal with the homeless. We have people that deal with spousal abuse. We have people that deal with drug interdiction. So maybe that could be part of the letter. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, Karen, you're looking at the camera. <laughs> or we could go to Rick either way. Karen, go for it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, all the things that have been on the news the last uh, several weeks or month, 
a lot of them have been appalling and deeply concerning. Um, and, and I think we do have to recognize, uh, the positions that people out in the field find themselves in. Um, and as Jefferson said, there are, uh, special teams that deal with groups, uh, the mental evaluation team, um, the, the offices are deal, dealing with the homeless, um, juvenile teams, you know, there, there are, there are a lot of groups I'm sure that are very good at what they do within, uh, the sheriff's department. Um, and I agree with Skylar. I think we could send a simple letter that says that we support, uh, our deputies and, and, uh, we support the department and we also support, um, uh, a common sense uh, restraint uh, in the use of force. And, and I think that's something that's already happening. So I, I, I don't think this is an item on the agenda in response to any, uh, any deep concern that we all have over, over uh, something we've seen in our area. That's all. Okay. Rick, did you have your hand up? I yeah, I did. Um, so I work with these guys all the time, law enforcement. And I, last night I had a domestic violence thing that we responded on and uh, they did an excellent job of de-escalation, I must say. And, um, you know, we turned the way back machine to this particular recent incident in another state, in a city, in another state where, uh, one person who was, uh, in custody, uh, lost his life, and that's tragic. And uh, from everything we can see, of course, we don't know everything, looked like it did not need to happen. And a lot has happened since that moment in time. And a lot of things that are not necessarily so good for law enforcement. Not only people talking about um, defunding them in certain cities, which I think is a big mistake. Uh, but you've seen uh, a lot of violence, a lot of destruction of commercial establishments uh, resulting from that one event. And I'd say the war, and cop, war on cops is back in full swing. And so th they have a very difficult job. A very difficult job. And I always say the firemen are more popular, but you can live without a fireman. You can't live without a law enforcement guy. And that's really the thing that keeps the wolves at bay. That's the thin blue line. And they have a lot of constraints on them that have been imposed on them through the years. And it's not easy to do their job. My experience with them is that they're all very professional and they have to be very careful about everything that they do. And they have, that's been true for many years. So there's a tendency when these uh, emotional events that get hyped by the media, and there's, of course, there's always a political angle in there, just kind of like COVID, that you can get uh, emotionally wound up. And I think enough time has gone by since this one particular event and all the aftermath that we can see, at least I can see, you know, as tragic as that one event was in another state, um, a world without law enforcement professionals is not a pretty one. And I think that some of the cities are starting to see that because they, they put their law enforcement officers in a position where they are probably a lot less likely to engage as they may have been in the past. And that's putting it mildly for some of them. And I think those cities are gonna regret that eventually. So I would be cautious about having any statement that says anything shy of the fact that we appreciate and support our law enforcement. It's probably a more appropriate message at this point. But I think that Skyler did make a good point in that uh, training is important, very important. 
And as much as these others have constraints upon them, I'm not so sure that they're getting all the training that they could to ensure that these tragic episodes don't uh, occur. So I would, I would, I'd, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable even insinuating something like, well, so you guys don't do something bad because I know you do bad things. I, I would be happy to put uh, a message of support for our law enforcement professionals. Yeah. Personally, appreciation, somebody who goes shoulder to shoulder with them and has for the last 20 years, and support for appropriate training so that they can do their very difficult job and very important job, uh, keeping not only all of us safe, but keeping uh, our social fabric in order. That's it. Thank you, Rick. Um, maybe four or five weeks ago, I was in a conversation with one of our law enforcement professionals, and I was surprised when he went on about a 10 minute rant about by name on cops in other states that are all over the media that had killed people that didn't seem necessary, not just one. He was really upset. He's upset because it demeans his profession, which he truly believes is about serving the public. And it was powerful to listen to him. I didn't say a word. He needed to get it out. And um, he talked about seeing it in the past and LASD as well. Just seeing people come along and what we all see in movies, you know, some come on with the best intentions, but it wears them down and they things go wrong. Sort of training issues that you, you were talking about. Um, their life goes sideways and the ability of a large organization to deal with that and manage it is, is overwhelming. But I think from what I know and can see, we're very fortunate that our local sheriffs seem overall, from what I'm aware of, to do a very good job finding the balance, drawing the line between taking really good care of our community and yet helping us where we really need their help. And I'm really appreciative of that. Um, certainly, I think, Rick, you mentioned the nationwide sentiment on what we've seen in a number of places from Washington, D.C. to Atlanta, on and on. We've seen some horrible things that are hard to comprehend. And I know horrible things have happened in California, too. Um, so oh, my long-winded way of saying I, I agree with the idea of the letter. To send support, um, and yet let you know, and say we hope you undertake the training to find that line. And I, it was really well said by that individual. It's, it's like you got to know the line. You got to understand it and live that line, where you serve the public. But if that line is crossed, you take action. Um, so, in essence, I'm saying I agree. Does somebody want to try and uh, form a motion on this, Skyler? So I just think I, we just need, I think, consensus, but would be to send a letter to the sheriff um, and the supervisors, uh, maybe just copy the supervisors on it, but just say that we very much, you know, are in support of the sheriff's department and all of the, you know, deputies that work in our area and others throughout the county, and that we know that they're, you know, may come under scrutiny at times or other things, but we just really hope that they're, you know, taking all the proper training in terms of use of force, et cetera, and that we really support them in doing so and keeping our community safe and we appreciate them. So to direct the, the city manager to put that letter together and then have the mayor send the letter? Yes. Yeah, I think it should basically say, uh, if I can put my own spin on the articulation, but, um, support, support for, appreciation for and encourage them to get all the uh, specialized training they need for their very difficult profession. Does that work? 
That sounds great. Any Got further it. comments? Okay. Oh, Jefferson. Uh, if we could add a sentence or two about the difficult times that are going through the nation, and uh, we look forward to supporting them during these difficult times as they support us. I think it's important to put that out there because a lot of these issues are being found out that the deputies are having a difficult time, just like the nurses and the doctors. I think just one sentence we can identify that would very be very helpful to the sheriff. Thank you. I agree with that. That's my peak. You too. Yeah, that's good. I mean, does uh, staff have enough direction? Yes, thank you. That's fine. Okay, so we're moving forward. Okay, 7B. Um, this is Mayor Fair here. So recently, Mayor Fair, uh, would you like to take this item? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, these are just uh, legislation position letters uh, on several bills, uh, both in the Assembly and the Senate. And, um, you know, the overriding uh, uh, motivation is uh, public safety and and consumer protection. So the staff report is pretty self-explanatory. I can I can go over them again if you want me to or uh, talk about them. But um, the, the only one that's opposition in opposition to is um, the very first one there. It's uh, AB 2167 and as you'll see in the second page, uh, that assembly bill is also opposed by the Consumer Watchdog, Consumer Federation, and the Insurance Commissioner, uh, believing that ultimately it will harm consumers. So uh, that one is in opposition. The others are all in support and uh, like I said, uh, I thank the staff for this report and it's, it's self-explanatory. Um, what, oh, Skylar, I'm sorry, one, one other thing. Um, if you'll look at 2178, it's asking for PSPS uh, as a cause for declaring a state or local, state of emergency or local emergency. And by doing that, um, it's acknowledging the cost to communities uh, for those power shutoffs. You know, they, they don't come without cost. Um, so, you know, we can go through these one by one or, uh, yeah, Skylar? I make a motion to support a former Mayor Fair's recommendation on all of the reference bills. Second. Do we have any public comment? Oh, yes. Thank you. I just realized that. Is there any public comment? Um, we do have one Clinton Brown, but he's, again, not in the meeting anymore. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, um, sorry. And the one uh, thing also is that uh, we would like our... Um, our lobbyists to keep us abreast of these items and um, and just uh, stay on top of them. And I will say on my weekly call with them, they've been doing a great job of that to date. Yeah, they've been fantastic. Absolutely. All right, we have a motion and a second, I believe. Who seconded? I'm sorry. Rick did. Rick did. Correct. Excellent. Do you like the roll call? Roll call, please. Thank you, Heather. Mayor Pro Tem Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yep. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We're on to item 7C. Um, my item, looking for council support on COVID Smart. Um, we already had a presentation, so I don't have to go back into that uh, unless people have questions, but clearly this is based on, um, I am extremely worried about our small businesses um, surviving 
through this. I'm always worried about them. Anyhow, uh, now more than ever, I have sussed this program out in great detail. Um, there's a, a lot of cities that want to come on board this. Um, I help them actually connect with a lot of cities as well. Um, every city is looking for some sort of standardized help so that their customers can feel a level of security. So uh, I don't know what else I need to add to that. I'm glad to answer any questions on their behalf. I'm not affiliated with them. I just, I'm all about small business. That's what I do. Um, so um, do we have any public speakers? We have four public speakers. Okay. Steve Hearing, Craig Hill, John Mazza, and Suzanne Zimmer. Okay, let's hear the public speakers. So first we'll hear from Steve Hearing. Good evening. We on board? Yep, yeah. and we can hear you. Okay, cool. All right. Um, well, I appreciate the council's interest in helping mail with small businesses. I don't believe this is a structure of, the, of this initiative is the best way to get there. While the proposal is to endorse a product, there's absolutely no evidence in the staff report from anyone in the, that anyone in the city has actually reviewed any of these training programs to confirm that they will produce a COVID safe environment they propose. I'm not even sure what a COVID safe environment even means. If, the, if a COVID safe environment on the door promises I will not contact, contact the virus, if I enter the building, then these guys are severely underpricing their product. Based upon the pricing presented in the COVID team, we saw in the PowerPoint presentation, it looks like Malibu businesses with between 10 and 20 employees will need to pay a minimum of somewhere between $35,000 and $40,000 for this program. There is no pricing for businesses with over 20 employees, which includes Ralph's Whole Foods, and vintage markets, some of the larger organizations. In addition, it appears that everyone will need to pay their, their COVID safe, have to pay to get their COVID safe display signs printed and shipped. And I have no idea what that's going to cost. Finally, giving this company unrestricted use of Malibu's name is problematic. There is nothing in the staff report that, that places a value on giving away this, this, our, our, our city name. What is that worth? And are we getting a return on that value? There is no, also nothing in the staff report that identifies how this name of Malibu will be used by this organization or who will be responsible for monitoring how it is used. Can they sell Malibu COVID t-shirts or stickers or who knows what else? A responsible third-party program would have rules to protect that from happening. So I hope we will re my suggestion is break, go back, think about this, Let's get some rules in place, understand what we're, we're offering, and then make sure we're going to do this right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next, we'll hear from Craig Hill. Okay, well, I'm batting a thousand tonight, so I don't know, maybe I should try reverse psychology or something. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I I have not spoken to Steve or, or anybody about this, but um, there's some overlap here. I, I see a couple things to think about, maybe some issues to sort out. First, can we clarify what the city's role would be? Partner, contractor, client, sponsor? Uh, that seems fuzzy to me. Secondly, might this be a service that could be out for multiple bids? Other companies provide similar functions, including Echolab and Yelp. Echolab has been involved in food service sanitation practices since the 1920s, Whereas this company is run by guys whose main listed experience online is in things like video games, fantasy, football, and the lottery. So I don't know, maybe they could do well, but I'm just wondering if there isn't a bit more research to be done here and then a triple bid process if the situation warrants it. Um, also, the company is asking for a commercial endorsement. The city has a program for generating fees or royalties on use of name or logo on the intellectual property. The company appears to be offering the city a slight discount on its services, whereas it appears they should be paying to use Malibu in their advertising, right? And then what is it worth to us? What might be the implications of being known as the COVID smart city? Would half of Southern California be thinking, hey, I just saw this on the news or Instagram that Malibu is COVID smart, so 
let's all go inundate that city where we can feel safe without our masks. Or conversely, what would be the upside of advertising ourselves as that? Um, maybe the casual listener hears it and thinks that COVID is something that's common here that we're used to dealing with. Um, then what happens when the wave of infection rolls through and we finally have a high per capita infection rate? Will we become a laughing stock for having been pitching what in effect could be perceived as the elitist view that we're untouchable? So, yeah, I mean, it, it might be fine to try in a few businesses to see how it goes, trial basis, what, figure out what this is about. But it seems like we'd be taking on a load of hubris to be perceived as so self-congratulatory as, quote, the world's first COVID smart community. I mean, that honor seems like it would go to New Zealand or South Korea or maybe the whole state of Hawaii, which has had only 19 deaths so far. So my over, overall comment would be to think this through some more. And um, I, I, I basically agree with a lot of what Steve said. So there you go. Thank you. Our final two speakers, John Mazza and Suzanne Zimmer, are not in the meeting anymore. Okay, so no more speakers? No. Okay, thanks. So I I have to say, I feel like the speakers, for whatever reason, either didn't read this or, I don't know, don't care about our local businesses. This doesn't guarantee, that's ridiculous to say it guarantees no one will get COVID. It's trying to help businesses show that businesses are doing the best they can to stay as safe as they possibly can. COVID's everywhere. And from the response that other cities have had to this, it's clear everyone's looking for a way to let the public know, hey, we're doing what we can. This program is backed by the Association of Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, the number one organization. Um, in that space. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to help our local businesses. Absolutely. Does it guarantee no one will get COVID? Obviously not. That's ridiculous. Um, they're doing it for very little money, which has nothing to do with the city. They're doing it to try and help local businesses. Kathy Eldon brought this to me, my cultural arts commissioner, who has an incredible record of helping people around the world on a variety of different ways. And uh, I, you know what, I, maybe I'm tired, but I just hope these people aren't nefarious in any way. They're just trying to find a way to affordably help businesses and the employees that work there understand how to be safe and clean. And so customers can, can have that experience as well. That's all there is to it. And if the people read the material, it would give a little more detail on that. And I saw Maz's letter and I saw that Robert responded, um, correcting some of the inaccuracies in his letter. So anyhow, that's where I'm at. And I welcome the council's comments. Oh, sorry, Rick. I think it's... Uh... Uh, you know, it's a changing world out there, but I hope it's not, this is not the new normal, you know, and I applaud these um, entrepreneurs for coming up with a uh, educational routine to um, enhance the ability of commercial establishments to wrestle with the challenges of the new COVID world. But I kind of, I'm hesitant to sort of sign on to or endorse or whatever it is we're looking for, something that's going to put more costs on them. You know, they, uh, it's almost like, okay, the city of Melbourne is all over this. If you're not COVID smart, you know, you're not with the program. So, oh, sh well, we got to sign up for something else. We got to do our dumpster lids. We got to do this. We got to do that. I mean, we should be very hesitant about um, encouraging things that impose more costs on those poor guys who have been beaten down by every aspect of this um, economic halt and shutdown and slowdown that they've been going through. I have no idea whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, 
but you mentioned the Chamber of Commerce. That's probably the appropriate place for this type of a thing to be um, discussed or promoted is in the Chamber of Commerce and for individual businesses to, uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm, you're a local businessman. You tell me, I mean, you're sitting around saying, okay, we've caught up on everything. We got our inventory. We've paid everything. We're doing great. Uh, you know, if we could just handle this like COVID compliance stuff, we really need somebody to help us with that. I don't know if that's, and, you know, the, I always look at for needs driven stuff. Maybe it is. I'm not sure, but I, a little hesitant to do anything that's going to impose more financial costs on businesses out there. So that's my hesitation on this. You know, we, I work in a, uh, the tip of the spear, you might say in the medical community in terms of uh, first responder stuff. And there's all manner of um, new ways of doing things and methodologies that came about and training stuff that, uh, we got from our department and the government of how to do things and um, you know they've evolved as we've gone forward and that all takes time and money and being government guys it's not that big a deal but if you're a, if you're a private company that's having a hard time making ends meet and and uh, you know you're just getting on your feet you're just getting back in business and uh, we throw even the sort of inference that they need to do something more to comply you must comply or you must incur more costs very hesitant to do that that's my general takeaway on this and i'm not making a commentary on the value of the program or not it's probably you know i'm giving them make it I'm benefit of the doubt and then assume that it's exactly what they say it is and give them 100 points for the quality of their program i just i you said it best at the beginning of this whole thing today Mike. you said we're going through tough times. It's, it's difficult. It's stressful. It's are dark days in many ways. And the, the darkest days for the individual businessmen and entrepreneurs out there that are really having their livelihoods with the emergency break on them by the government. And um, not all of them, some of them are on board. And not all of them are on board with everything that's being imposed on them. So very hesitant to do anything that adds more friction to their ability to get their wheels in motion again. And then I'm impressed. I guess the corollary to that is, no, no, you're helping them because then they're more compliant to that. But I think everyone kind of gets the whole thing. It's like, hey, wash your hands, wear a mask uh, in certain places and social distance and all of that. So I'm not really sure what the program's all about. Those are my general comments. A couple of comments. Um, the chamber is very much in support and they're, one of the groups that asked me to bring this forward to help them help small businesses. Malibu Country Mart, was, they were instantly interested in this. The problem people are having is people are, the problem businesses are having, people are scared to go in businesses and it's, it's hurting their bottom line hugely. So this program is to try and let people know, hey, we, we've actually done some education and we're doing the best we can. There's no requirement for a business to do this at all. But, you know, when people put up different signs that are handwritten, there's no real program, that's not in, in, engendering a lot of security to people to go in there. Um, there's, this comes with a, you can even QR code it. So, yeah, I'm a believer in it, and I, I get your uh, reluctance. But there's, you know, this is just trying to help our businesses so when people come up to them and go, okay, I know that there's always a risk being out in public, but I'm going to go in there. Um, that That's what it's about. So that's that's the idea of the program. And uh, the materials are good. I've been through them all. But, you know, that's that's my perspective. And I, I welcome more comment. Jefferson. Thank you, Mikey. I uh, have been a small retailer here in Malibu for 45 years. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate the effort from the Chamber of Commerce, of which I am a member, uh, and understand the complexities of going through this COVID. I, I appreciate your efforts and the Chamber's efforts, as I mentioned. However, a lot of this information to do the right thing for your business is all online. Uh, LA County has sites that you can do. I've already done my COVID uh, resistance hardening or stiffening up of my business with the plastic screens, three different cleaners, masks required for employees 
spatial separation, no more than six people in 1,000 square feet. There's a number of things that are out there for you to discover if you just take a few minutes. Putting the program out there for those of some businesses that couldn't afford it and a QR code, and then you say, well, there's a business that says, says they're doing it right, and there's a guy that hasn't done it. It doesn't mean that that person isn't COVID aware. It just means they didn't want to go through the criteria of paying out to a, to a private company to enlist them with proper signage or whatever fabrications that they would put forward to small retailers. I just see it as another impedance on doing business right now. The market will drive behavior standards. If you don't behave, you won't be in business much longer. That's, that's kind of how it is. And that's what we're seeing out there. Also, um, about a year or two ago, I brought before the city manager a program where the three storm drains would be provided by a company to do all our free storm drains. And she may remember this. And she said, well, th that sounds like something you should go out to bid or something that we, re we should research before we bring it to the council. And I complied with her wishes and I told the vendor, hey, you've got to bring it to the council, throw it out there, get a, get a fair appraisal, show us who's in competition with you. And nothing happened. The, 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 they, they were going to do it for free. Coincidentally, it never came about because there was resistance within. And I'm sorry, we don't have free storm drains. Now we're paying for them. But just to get back to my point is I think we need to explore this a little further. The company did put on their website the name Malibu. Uh, I did research this. Uh, did put their name Malibu out there before it was even on the, approved by the council. We paid a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in royalty fees to set something up to show the value of the city of the name of Malibu and the moniker that we created as a city. And we've gotten no income back from that. So there's a number of problems that I see uh, with this, not knocking it. I appreciate the efforts, but at this time, I would just say we've got to research this a little more. Thank you, Mikey. Okay, thank you. Last comment. Someone said thirty thousand dollars. It's twenty dollars an employee. Just it's, there's no thirty thousand dollars unless they have. What would that be? Six hundred employees. So anyhow, yeah, Karen. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know where the thirty forty thousand came from. That surprised me too. I don't think we have any business that has that many employees. Um, but I will say this, um, the information uh, provided here, it may not be um, packaged as, as uh, attractively, but this is information that's available online. Um, and and I, I guess the point of this is, is to have uniform uh, messaging and, and a logo and, and uh, something that's easily recognizable but this is information that's available on the county website so i think that's that's the difference um our business is just going to do this on their own uh and and live with the results if they don't um you know or do they want to sign on and have this this logo and this this set of um, of messaging, um, and and it might be something that is better left to the Chamber of Commerce than to us as a city. And I'm not, I'm not saying I don't support the idea, but I don't know if the city is the right place for it. That's all I have to say. Okay, Skylar, any comments or a motion? Um, because I, I want to be able to support this, but I just I'm not like a hundred percent convinced. So I would make a motion for us to uh, not endorse it at this time. Uh, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tempe? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Um, is that a yes to table? 
Yes. Yes. It's, it's to take no action tonight on the item. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Mullen. Yes. Mayor Pearson. No. Motion carries. Okay, we're on item 7D and that Horizon Hills Fire Safe Council, and that is uh, Council Member Mullen's item. Uh, Rick, you can take this. Yeah, this is just basically a letter affirming that, you know, um, the Horizon Hills is a model sort of Fire Safe Council, which involves a lot of bureaucracy. They have to put in um, requests for grants, they have to comply with stuff, and uh, what they're looking for from us is a letter essentially saying that they're going to get from the city a certain amount of support for their efforts as a fire safe council. It was a little gray initially when they said it, but it sounded like we were actually saying we we're going to pony up some cash for them, and that's not the case. It's basically just a letter saying that we support the counts, uh, their fire safety council, and we support them with our fire safety advisor and um, the uh, resources of the public safety department of the city, essentially. And there's a copy of the letter here, basically. And that's it. And, you know, I already wrote one anyway to the guy, so that's just letting you guys know. So that's, you can see a copy of the letter that I did, but um, this is to actually be from the mayor, if possible, if you're up for it. Mikey, just so you know, you're muted. Thank you. No, I did not know I was muted. Yeah, and this falls uh, under the big three of, you know, public safety, rebuilds, and school stuff. Do we have a pub any public speakers on this item? No, we do not. Okay. Um, comments or a motion? Jefferson? Thank you, Mike. Appreciate this, Rick. Uh, I think these little community efforts are going to be what saves us in the next big one. At least they'll be trained and they'll be familiar with the, the jargon of the L.A. County Fire Department. They're going to educate themselves. We saw what a valuable resource the, the guys up in Corral were. They have their Fire Safe Council up in Corral. So uh, I, as I see this, this is going to be part of the future. And thank you for identifying it. And I hope uh, the letter helps helps them out. Thank you. Yeah, your comments are right on. I believe that, you know, should Woolsey 2 come, and Mikey talked about this earlier, is the, the resiliency, the strength of the resiliency of our town starts with the individual and then in the neighborhood community uh readiness groups or whatever they call themselves whether they be people who encourage like these guys do really superior job of brush clearance and they get extra money and resources for them they do a phenomenal job at it or the Melbourne west fire brigade or you know just a group of people who look out for each other i think that's really the backbone of the resiliency of Melbourne moving forward so i'm really glad and brian does an outstanding job and he pretty much wrote the book on this so I'm glad that we're able to support them in their efforts. And it's, they're only asking for a letter, so I think it's good. All right, do we have a motion? I'll make the motion. So the, the motion is to, send, is to send a letter similar to what was outlined here, but without a commitment of, of, uh, of resources, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, did we have a second? What was the second? I'll do second. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Wagner. Yes. Councilmember Mullen. Yep. Councilmember Fairer. Yes. Mayor Pro Tempe. Yes. Mayor Pearson. Yes. And Rick, I gather we'll see you on Saturday at our. Uh, Volunteer Fire Brigade event. I'm hoping I can make it down there. I'm working up in uh, a little further away, but I might be able to weasel my way down. Okay, great. Um, all in favor of a journey? Aye. Well done, Mayor. Okay. Thank you all. Um, 
and have a good night or have a good morning, I should say. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone.